What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid. Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Tob and Toda came to a stop. They were both heaving, and they needed time to catch their breath. Toda, can you still go on? Tob's voice cut through the din of battle, his tone laced with a hint of challenge. Tob met his brother's gaze and a confident smirk, formed on his face, this is just a warm-up, Tob, he replied, his voice steady despite the situation they currently were in. In another part of the battlefield, Tob and Toda were facing a problem of their own. Together, they had dealt with more than ten chunins, but their progress faced an obstacle in the form of three jounin level shinobis. Although they were just chunins, their resolve was reaffirmed and the brothers moved as one towards the trio of jounin level opponents, their movements fluid and coordinated. Tobe's hands danced through a series of signs as he summoned forth an array of deadly weapons such as kunais, shurikens, and more. He intended to guide them with expert precision using intricate strings of chakra. As the projectiles closed in on their targets, Tobe infused them with crackling lightning, increasing their speed to lethality levels. The weapons streaked through the air like bolts of lightning, honing in on their targets with ungodly accuracy. Not to be outdone, Toda unleashed his own barrage of shurikens, each one imbued with the blazing fury of fire chakra. With practiced ease, he threw two shurikens before employing the clone shurikens jutsu, multiplying the projectiles almost a hundredfold in a dazzling display. The air crackled with energy as the fiery shuriken soared through the sky, heading to the trio of jounins. As the deadly barrage of projectiles hurtled towards them, the enemy jounin remained steadfast, their expressions cool and composed despite the impending onslaught. With practice precision, one of the jounin swiftly formed a series of hand signs. With a resounding slam of his hands upon the ground, the Jounin unleashed his jutsu, causing a massive earthen wall to erupt from the ground in front of them. The wall took on a convex shape, curving outward to cover them from the projectiles hurtling towards them from the front and above. Clang! The kunais and shurikens slammed into the earthen barrier with explosive force, embedding themselves in the hardened surface with a series of dull thuds. Some managed to penetrate the outer layers of the wall, but the majority were deflected or stopped entirely by the formidable defense erected by the Jounin. Seeing that a majority of the Kanoha Ninja's projectiles had been neutralized, the two other enemy Jounins prepared to retaliate, their concentration focused on conjuring their own Jutsu. However, they were caught off guard by the sudden shift in the trajectory of the projectiles hurtling towards them from above. In a burst of smoke and chakra, Tobe and Toda swiftly appeared in place of the incoming projectiles, appearing directly above the enemy Jounin in a well-coordinated maneuver. Before the Jounin could react, the Uchiha brothers unleashed their combined fire and lightning jutsu. However, the enemy Jounins were quick to react, and two of the Jounins flickered away from the point of impact in a blur of movement. The scorching flames and crackling lightning erupted harmlessly in the empty space where they had stood moments before only hitting the one who was holding the erected earth wall in place. One down. Tobe thought as the Uchiha brothers landed gracefully on the ground. But they couldn't rest as they immediately found themselves confronted by the two enemy Jounins who had now completed their jutsus. With swift and calculated movements, the Jounin unleashed their jutsus, intent on turning the tide of battle in their favor. The Jounin facing Tobe unleashed the violent wind jutsu, channeling their chakra to create a powerful gust of wind aimed directly at the Uchiha brother. The wind howled fiercely as it tore through the air, carrying with it razor-sharp blades of air pressure that threatened to slice through anything in their path. Meanwhile, the Jounin facing Toda focused their chakra to expel a torrent of water, shaping it into a formidable water blast jutsu. With a forceful surge, the pressurized water surged towards Toda propelled by the Jounin's skilled manipulation of chakra. 
The Jounins were clearly calculative as they both used chakra natures that would counter the brothers. The Winjutsu would counter any lightning attack Tobe decided to unleash while the water would do the same to Toda. You are using wind? Fine, thanks for the help. Tobe unleashed the ferocious flames of the great fireball Jutsu towards his opponent. The fireball did not just counter the winds, but a part of it was also amplified to a blazing inferno as it hurled towards the Jounin. Meanwhile, the other Jounin, who had recovered from the brothers' combination Jutsu, seized the opportunity to join the fray once more turning the battle into a two-on-one confrontation against Tobe. The Jounin immediately used the earth wall Jutsu again to counter the approaching fireball. Boom! The fireball collided with the earth wall and instantly pulverized it. Although the wall was destroyed, it mediated much of the force and even gave the Jounin's time to avoid the fireball. Toda also adapted to the situation. Unable to employ Earth Jutsu and counter his opponents like his brother, he improvised, utilizing his lightning affinity to electrify the water created by his opponent's Jutsu. With a swift and precise hand sign, Toda infused his lightning chakra into the surrounding water, transforming it into a deadly conduit of electrical energy. Crack! The water crackled and surged with power as the Jounin, caught off guard by Toda's ingenuity, found himself ensnared in a web of electricity. Caught in the grip of Toda's electrified onslaught, the Jounin struggled to withstand the relentless barrage of lightning, his movements slowed and defenses compromised by the overwhelming shock coursing through his body. As the two Jounins, the ones who used the wind and earth jutsus pressed their assault on Tobe, the young Uchiha's reflexes were put to the test. With grace Tobe danced between the Jounin strikes, evading their attacks with fluid movements and lightning-fast reflexes. Each blow was met with a swift and precise counter, as Tobe expertly turned the Jounin's aggression against them. Meanwhile, Toda suddenly flickered from his dazed opponent and appeared behind the Jounin adept in Wind Jutsus. His reappearance caught the Jounin off guard, leaving them vulnerable to the brothers' coordinated assault. With a seamless display of teamwork, Toda and Tobe plunged their blades deep into the Jounin's heart, their weapons finding their mark with deadly accuracy. The Jounin staggered, their strength faltering as the fatal blow pierced their chest, a look of shock and disbelief crossing their face as they realized the gravity of their situation. No! The other Jounin, adept in Earth Jutsus, roared. The two remaining Jounins closed in, their rage burning like a wildfire, they flickered with deadly intent, their movements swift and unforgiving. In a flash, their blades found their mark, plunging deep into the chests of Tobe and Toda, their hearts pierced by the enemy's merciless assault. However, Tobe looked at the Jounin stabbing him and said, Hirata, what have you done? Hmm? How does he know my name? Hirata thought. It was then that an ominous thought flashed in his mind causing him to disrupt his chakra. In a disorienting blur of motion, the scene before him flickered and shifted, revealing a shocking truth that left him stunned. Instead of Tobe and Toda being at the mercy of their attackers, it was Hirata himself who had struck the fatal blow, his blade piercing the heart of his remaining ally. They, they used a Jinjutsu on me? What, have I done? Hirata couldn't help but mutter. A couple of meters from him, Hirata saw his ally, the Jounin who used Wind Jutsus lay dead. It was clear that he had suffered the fate that Hirata had seen before. So, if that happened when did their opponent set their Jinjutsu? From the very start, the enemy Jounins were always wary of the brothers when they saw their Sharingans and continuously disrupted their chakras so that they couldn't fall under any Jinjutsu. Unfortunately, they couldn't keep doing that throughout the fight as they still needed to use Ninjutsu against their opponents. Tobe and Toda had been subtle with their Jinjutsu use as they started by implating suggestions in their brains as they chipped away their target's mental fortitude. When they killed their ally, the two enemy Jounins were angered and that opened the door for the Uchiha to use Jinjutsu. Luckily for them, they fell for their Jinjutsu and used one to kill the other. Erg! Hirata roared. He was beyond mad and was reeling from the fact that both his comrades were dead. You will pay for this. He said as his chakra flared up and his muscles started pulsating. Tobe immediately used a lightning cannon at Hirata as he felt something bad was about to happen, he did not know how right he was. Neat trick, Uchiha. The figure in front of Renjiro scoffed. Damn it. I am an Uzumaki. Besides that, this is a Jounin. I am not sure if I can face him and win. The chakra he is exuding seems sinister. 
Rinjiro thought as his gaze focused on the figure before him. Standing tall and imposing, the man exuded an aura of strength and confidence. He towered over Renjiro with his lean yet muscular frame a formidable sight to behold. He was wearing dark grey robes that reminded Renjiro of a certain village elder in their later years. But it was the weapon in the man's hand that drew Renjiro's attention the most. It was a sword, its blade gleaming in the dim light of the room. Unlike most swords Renjiro had seen before, this one lacked a conventional hilt, instead adorned with nothing more than simple bandages wrapped tightly around its handle. I shouldn't even bother using Jinjutsu on him, he already saw me using it against their chunins, so he would probably be wary about it and start disrupting his chakra. While that does not mean it won't work, it just means that it would be harder for him to fall for it. Despite the daunting presence of this new arrival, Renjiro remained composed. His was mind clear and his senses sharp as he awaited for the figure in front of him to make the first move. He isn't attacking me, so he isn't rash. But if he isn't going to come to me then I will gladly go to him. The robbed man thought as he closed the distance between himself and Renjiro in a flash and used his sword to strike at Renjiro's side. Bap! The sound of steel meeting flesh reverberated, Renjiro had reacted with his lightning-fast reflexes, his arms snapping up to intercept the slashing strike aimed at his side. He is strong, very strong. Renjiro widened his eyes. The force of the blow sent shockwaves rippling through his muscles, causing a jolt of pain to shoot up his arms as he absorbed the impact. It happened so fast that Renjiro did not get time to retrieve any bladed weapon, or even his staff to block the sword strike so he opted to use his forearm. If I had known he was this strong, I would have tried to dodge it. Actually no, if I did try to dodge it, he would have followed it with another strike. A huge gash appeared on Renjiro's forearms as a result of the blocking. This caused the man to smirk at the sight as he introduced himself, I am Kurigane Ohashi. Nice to meet you. Though Renjiro remained silent in response, he did not have time to reply when the smile was wiped off Ohashi's face as he noticed the wound on Renjiro's arm started to heal. The healing was not instant or anything close to that, but it was fast enough for it to be registered by the naked eye. He can also regenerate? I just hope it isn't as crazy as those cult bastards. Ohashi thought. While Ohashi was still stupefied by what had just happened, Renjiro saw this opportunity and took it. He channeled his chakra with deliberate precision and after he reinforced his arm with in chakra, he punched Ohashi squarely in the face. As the powerful punch connected with Ohashi, the force of the blow sent him hurtling backwards, crashing into the surrounding wall with a bone-jarring impact. Yet, that was not enough to deter him as Ohashi's resilience proved unyielding with him swiftly rising to his feet. Damn it! I need to be serious! Ohashi inwardly cursed. Crack! Ohashi twisted his jaw into place before he hurled two shurikens toward Renjiro with deadly accuracy, the gleaming blade slicing through the air with lethal intent. Seeing the approaching shurikens, Renjiro sprang into action as he retrieved his staff from a storage seal in a seamless motion. With deft precision, he intercepted the incoming shurikens, embedding his staff into the shurikens' eyes and using their momentum to redirect them back towards Ohashi. Slash. However, Ohashi was already completing his next move as he swung his sword and released chakra slashes at Renjiro. As the shurikens arced through the air, they served as a temporary barrier against the oncoming onslaught of chakra slashes. Though the chakra slashes sliced each shuriken into two, the seconds it took to do so gave Renjiro enough time to prepare his jutsu. Following a deep breath, Renjiro decided to use the fiery power of his most potent jutsu, the majestic destroyer flame. He unleashed a torrent of scorching flames that engulfed Ohashi and the remnants of the chakra slashes in a searing inferno. Renjiro then deftly landed on a nearby tree branch watching as the intense flames roared to life with blistering intensity. While the jutsu was his strongest, Renjiro knew that it was not enough to deal with Ohashi so he steeled himself for anything the latter would try to do next. Thankfully, Ohashi acted sooner as Renjiro was forced to dodge a deadly rain of senbons that hurtled toward him with lethal precision before he flickered away. Renjiro's eyes narrowed as he locked onto the source of the senbons which was unsurprisingly Ohashi. He had used an earth jutsu to traverse the terrain and appear behind Renjiro in a flash of movement. With a calculated flick of his wrist, Ohashi unleashed another volley of senbons towards Renjiro. 
This time Renjiro did not doge and instead intercepted several of the poison projectiles, his hands moving with precision as he deflected them away from his body. As the Senbans clattered harmlessly to the ground, Renjiro examined them closely, so they are poisonous. I guess this time to test the extent of my chakra senu. A grim smile tugged at the corners of his lips as a plan was forming in his mind. He closed the distance between them and threw another punch, ignoring the senbans hitting him and those already sticking out in his skin. Renjiro's fist sliced through the air with precision, as he aimed directly at Ohashi's chest. However, the Jounin anticipated the attack, smoothly sidestepping. In the same fluid motion, Ohashi countered with a powerful palm strike of his own, aimed squarely at Renjiro's midsection. That's weird, he was punching earlier but now he is using plam attacks. Is he changing his taijutsu style? Renjiro thought as he took the full brunt of the attack. He had experienced both puchas and sword strikes of Ohashi and from what he felt the palm attacks were the weakest. So Renjiro was confused as to why Ohashi opted for that medium of attack. The clash between the two shinobi intensified as it continued, their movements blurring as they fully displayed their taijutsu styles. Each strike was met with a swift block or evasion, as they both tried to get an advantage against the other. Despite all that, neither Renjiro nor Ohashi could gain the upper hand, their movements locked in a tense stalemate. This isn't helping. After blocking a few pal attacks, Renjiro executed a backward flip, as his mind raced with strategies to gain an advantage over Ohashi. However, as he landed and prepared to unleash his wind jutsu, a sudden wave of discomfort washed over him causing him to falter. What? I is happening? A sharp pang of pain shot through Renjiro's body, causing him to grimace as he struggled to maintain his focus. It felt as though his chakra was being disrupted, interfering with his ability to perform ninjutsu effectively. I is this poison? Renjiro could not help but mutter. Maybe I overestimated my chakra senu, I should have just avoided those poison senbans. Renjiro's brow furrowed in thought. He attempted to pinpoint the source of the disruption by probing his chakra network for any irregularities or blockages that could be causing the interference. While there was some logic to this action, it only made things worse as the pain intensified. It even now carried a new sensation that overtook Renjiro. Renjiro's heart pounded in his chest with a mixture of fear and frustration as he recognized this sensation, it was paralysis. As the seconds passed by, Renjiro struggled against an invisible force that held him in place, but it was as if his muscles refused to respond to his commands. Shit. I can't move. The paralysis was followed by some black stripes that started to mar Renjiro's. Each mark seared him with an intense heat, causing Renjiro to grit his teeth against the pain. All this happened in a span of a few seconds making Renjiro paralyzed in an uncomfortable position. Ohashi who was just about to make his next move stopped and laughed at the sight. Rinjiro was in a state of pure frustration. It was as though he was trapped within his own body. Each attempt he made to move felt like pushing against an unyielding wall, his muscles refusing to respond to his commands. The last time Rinjiro was in a similar situation was way back when he transmigrated into this world. He clearly remembered when he woke up in a strange body in Yuzushiogakure and the overwhelming sense of helplessness as he couldn't move and was relegated to a watcher of the original Renjiro's childish actions. And now, faced with a similar sense of confinement, Renjiro couldn't help but feel a twinge of deja vu. It also unlocked a new fear Renjiro did not know he had, claustrophobia. This was weird because it meant that Renjiro was basically uncomfortable in his own body. Calm down, Renjiro. You need to think straight. This cannot be poison, the burning stripes already prove that, so these might be some sort of sealing jutsu. Is it Juujitsu? Most probably. I just need to find a way to undo it. With a silent vow to overcome this obstacle, Renjiro focused his thoughts, channeling his chakra all over his body with a newfound intensity. Haha. <laughs> Ohashi's mocking laughter filled the air. With a malicious smirk, Ohashi began, his voice dripping with contempt as he reveled in his opponent's suffering. It finally happened right? I was a bit annoyed that it was taking longer than usual. It seemed that Ohashi's words subtly controlled the marks on Renjiro's body as the sensation of burning intensified, the searing pain spreading like wildfire across his skin. But when did he use the Juenjutsu on me? Renjiro wondered. 
But before he could even ponder more, Ohashi seemed to read his mind and answered, I had to limit myself to only using palm attacks to place the seals on you. With my attack growing weaker, you might have actually won, but I'm glad everything went according to plan, Ohashi stated. Rinjiro's mind raced as he processed Ohashi's words. I should have known. I already suspected that he was planning something. But enough of that, though our mission only included attacking the village and its shinobi, it doesn't mean that I can't enjoy myself, Ohashi said menacingly. I am going to kill you. But before I do, I first need to get those precious eyes of yours. At that moment, Renjiro felt a surge of anger rising within him. He did not know why, but it also made him realize how vulnerable the situation he was in. He could actually lose his life for a second time. I need to break free from this as fast as possible. With every ounce of determination he could muster, Renjiro focused his chakra, channeling it throughout his body in a desperate attempt to counteract the Juinjutsu that held him captive. After his declaration, Ohashi naturally walked closer to Renjiro. His intent was clear by the glow of his hands which showed that he was reinforcing his hands for what he was going to do. Then, Ohashi stopped inches from Renjiro, before plunging his fingers in the latter's left eye socket. A different pain from the seals began assaulting Renjiro. Eh? His skin is hard. Ohashi thought as he used more chakra and strength to plunge deeper into Renjiro's flesh. Renjiro's world blurred with agony and pain as Ohashi's fingers kept digging at his flesh. Blood mingled with the sweat on his brow as he fought to maintain his focus, he had to free himself as far as possible. Fortunately for Renjiro, his efforts bore fruits as the Yang Chakra reached a new level and unleashed a torrent of power that surged through his veins. Arf! With a primal roar, Renjiro unleashed his newfound strength, pushing against the confines of his paralysis with all his might. Renjiro unleashed his fury in the form of a shockwave. As the shockwave rippled outward from Renjiro, the whole area seemed to bend to its will. Debris that littered the area was sent hurtling through the air like leaves in a tempest. Houses that once stood proud and resolute were now little more than shattered remnants of their former selves due to the fight, but their foundations were torn asunder by the force of the shock wave. Walls crumbled, roofs collapsed, and the very earth trembled beneath the weight of his chakra-infused onslaught. Even Ohashi, whose body was already battered and bruised from their fierce battle, was not spared from the shockwave's relentless advance. He was sent tumbling through the air like a ragdoll, his form tossed and twisted by the raw power that surged around him. But perhaps the most dramatic effect was the transformation of the ground itself. As the shockwave swept across the battlefield, the earth beneath Renjiro's feet caved in, forming a vast crater that stretched out in all directions. It was as if the very earth had been rent asunder by the sheer force of his will. Luckily, the shockwave gradually ended leaving a trail of destruction in its wake leaving both Renjiro and Ohashi lying unconscious amidst the wreckage. After a few minutes, Ohashi stirred. He struggled to regain his senses, the world around him seemed to spin and blur. His head throbbed with a dull ache, each pulse sending waves of pain coursing through his skull like a relentless drumbeat. Where the hell am I? For a moment, Ohashi found himself disoriented, unable to make sense of his surroundings as his consciousness flickered back into focus. Wait, I was fighting the boy. As he slowly pieced together the fragments of his shattered memories, Ohashi's eyes widened in disbelief at the sheer scale of the destruction that lay before him. All this destruction. I need to look for the boy, if he has this much power at this age, then he might be a headache in future. I need to kill him now. Ohashi began scanning the rubble and ruin, but there was no sign of Renjiro. Panic gnawed at Ohashi's mind as he frantically searched for any trace of the young shinobi who had brought such devastation upon them. And then, amidst the wreckage and debris, Ohashi spotted a figure lying motionless on the ground. It was Renjiro, his body lying prone amidst the ruins of their battlefield. With a surge of adrenaline coursing through his veins, Ohashi staggered to his feet. With trembling hands, Ohashi retrieved a kunai from his belt. Summoning the last reserves of his chakra, Ohashi fixed several explosive tags to the kunai and with a flick of his wrist, he launched the deadly projectile towards Renjiro. The kunai landed several meters from Renjiro and the explosive tag set off upon impact unleashing a deafening blast that reverberated through the air. But the explosion did not even hurt Renjiro. It seemed that there was a barrier surrounding him, protecting him from the explosion. 
The only thing that followed was Renjiro waking up from the commotion caused by the explosion. Wait. It was then that Renjiro realized that something was wrong with him. He has lost his left eye. Before Renjiro had his outburst, Ohashi was busy digging into one of his eye sockets. So the repulsion force he got hit by from the shockwave was all he needed to finally get one of Renjiro's eyes, although he lost it just before losing consciousness. My body just feels different. Renjiro surmised. Losing an eye was not as fun as many would think, and that was what Renjiro was feeling. He felt empty like he had a void that gnawed at the very core of his being. But even as the pain he felt all over his body and his eyes threatened to overwhelm him, Renjiro's thoughts were drawn to a different sensation. He felt that there was something different with his body, no it wasn't his missing eye, it was something else. The worst thing was that Renjiro could neither trace nor explain what it was. While Renjiro was still trying to get a hold of his current predicament, Ohashi sent out lightning bullets directly towards him. Ooh, I had forgotten about him. Renjiro thought as he wanted to roll over to avoid the lightning bullets. But something strange happened when he tried to do so. When he thought of avoiding the incoming attacks, he had planned to use his arms and in one motion roll over. This was not what happened as Renjiro's body was moved by what appeared to be huge metallic gleaming chains. What? Renjiro's heart raced as he struggled to make sense of the sudden emergence of chains from his torso. Each metallic link seemed to gleam with energy, Renjiro guessed that it was chakra. Did I finally get my second chakra Senu? What the hell is that? Ohashi questioned as he witnessed Renjiro seemingly dodge his lightning bullets. Finally. Though this is good, if it happened earlier maybe I wouldn't have lost my eye. I just hope I get some way to fix it. As Renjiro concentrated, a sense of clarity washed over him, suffusing his being with newfound purpose. With a mere thought, he commanded the chains to retract, and to his amazement, they obeyed, coiling back into his body with an almost serpentine grace. Great. It feels like I have gotten new limbs. Renjiro's eyes widened in awe as he realized the true extent of his newfound power. He continued manipulating it in various directions before concluding, but it takes up more chakra than I expected, especially now when I do not have much to use. I need to deal with Ohashi quickly. He is responsible for the gap on my face, it's only fine if I return the favor. Blitz. The person in question did not give up and sent another set of lightning bullets towards Renjiro. When Renjiro saw the bullets approaching, he instinctively raised his hand, summoning forth a barrier to deflect the oncoming onslaught of lightning bullets. With a flick of his wrist, the bullets collided with the ethereal barrier, sending ripples of energy cascading through the air before dissipating into nothingness. Now this is better, it is vastly different from any barrier ninjutsu I learnt and also more efficient. Nothing much was shown and said about this sub-ability of it. If I keep working on it maybe I could improve it to Susano levels. With each passing moment, Renjiro felt his connection to the chains growing stronger. He knew that with time and practice, he would learn to wield their power with precision and skill, becoming an unstoppable force on the battlefield. But for now, Renjiro focused on the task at hand. As Renjiro prepared to counter Ohashi, he saw the latter making hand signs. Ohashi then bit his thumb before a large cloud of smoke suddenly appeared all around the two. What is he trying to do? Renjiro thought as he tried to see through the smoke around him. He was already finding it hard to see with one of his eyes, but now even that was made harder with the smoke. With his vision near obscured, Renjiro gave up and decided to just rely on his chakra field. Renjiro focused inward, reaching out with his chakra senses to feel the chakra around him. Despite the dense smoke obscuring his vision, he could still perceive the subtle fluctuations in the chakra field, like ripples on the surface of a pond disturbed by an unseen force. Wait why am I sensing my chakra? Renjiro muttered as he flickered to the unidentified source. It was only a couple of feet from him. What Renjiro met was his missing eye. It seemed that it was still exuding his chakra. Thank God, with a bit of medical ninjutsu this would be reattached back. Renjiro said as he stored the eye in one of his storage seals. He could not just pop it back into its eye socket and hope that his regeneration kick in and solve a majority of his problems. Renjiro feared that it was somehow infected so he chose to abandon that option. While that could still be fixed with medical ninjutsu, Renjiro did not want to risk it even though he was still in the middle of a fight. As Renjiro used his chakra field again, 
He sensed a large malicious chakra before he heard a loud roar. Roar. Rinjiro's attention immediately snapped back to the present after the roar reverberated through the air. It was a sound that sent shivers down his spine. Did he summon something? The chakra I sensed was not as much as what I sensed from Kushina. But then again, Kurama had the largest chakra reserves bar ten tails. Suddenly the dense smoke began to disperse, revealing an unexpected sight. It was a golden leopard turtle, its form massive and imposing, its shell adorned with intricate patterns that gleamed in the faint light. Renjiro could scarcely believe his eyes as he beheld the awe-inspiring sight before him, the sheer scale of the creature dwarfing even the formidable figure of Ohashi Kurigane. What is it Kurigane? The giant leopard turtle asked. I need help Mizuki, Ohashi began, I need time to heal so that I can use that. Who do you need help against? Mizuki, the giant leopard turtle, asked. Him, Ohashi pointed at Renjiro. Mizuki turned his body and looked at Renjiro. Even with that distance, he was able to see the young shinobi and even see through him. Why are you fighting in Uzumaki? I thought your clan knew better than this. Mizuki asked. Wait, Uzumaki? What do you mean by dash? Mizuki interrupted Ohashi as he used one of his limbs and forced him into his shell. Good thing he is still so young. I can just kill him and then get some rest. Before Renjiro could react, the golden turtle surged forward with astonishing speed, closing the distance between them in the blink of an eye. Despite its immense weight, the creature moved with an agility and swiftness that seemed to defy the laws of physics, its movements deft and precise. And with a suddenness that took Renjiro by surprise, the golden turtle came to a halt before him. But as quickly as it had appeared, the creature opened its massive jaws, unleashing a torrent of green, viscous liquid in Renjiro's direction. But to Mizuki's surprise, the noxious substance never reached him. Instead, it splattered against an invisible barrier surrounding him, the adamantine chains he had recently awakened pulsating with a faint blue glow as their barrier repelled the attack. It is either poison or an acid. Renjiro thought as he observed the dark green smoke rising from the area where Mizuki's acidic attack had landed, which was all around the barrier. This confirmed his suspicions about its corrosive nature. This barrier sure is handy. But with that said how am I going to deal with this huge turtle? Before making a move, Renjiro knelt down beside the barrier and focused his concentration on allowing a small portion of the substance Mizuki had used to attack him to pass through. Let's see if I can handle his attacks. As the green liquid seeped into the barrier, Renjiro extended his hand towards it, his fingertips making contact with the substance. It feels fine. Renjiro's relief washed over him as he realized that, despite the unsettling sensation of the liquid against his skin, it had failed to inflict any significant harm. With a sense of reassurance, he deactivated the barrier, allowing it to dissipate as he retracted the chains back into his body. The acidic liquid came at him with force, but since he was immune to it, it only affected the lower part of his pants and the sandals he was wearing. This was bearable as Renjiro did not really need them while fighting. Ohashi is somewhere inside this turtle. I just need to go through it. Attacking from above isn't an option since I am sure the shell would be really hard. I don't know how strong these chains are, at least my version, but I will have to make do with them. With a plan in mind, Renjiro began to move. His movements were swift and decisive as he manifested two adamantine chains and willed them to extend and ensnare the huge turtle before him. With practice precision, the chains coiled around the creature's neck, constricting tightly as Renjiro slowly retracted them so as to gain enough force to propel himself onto its massive shell. As he landed atop the turtle's back, Renjiro could feel the sturdy carapace beneath his feet, its surface rough and textured against his palms. It felt like he was on a rocky hill or mountain. Gripping firmly onto the shell for balance, Renjiro steadied himself. Unlike his movement speed, Mizuki was actually slow in reacting when Renjiro wrapped his chains around the turtle's neck. He found it hard to free himself, but Renjiro attributed that to the chains nullifying his chakra and making him weak. With the chain securely wrapped around the turtle's neck, Renjiro knew that he had gained a strategic advantage. His plan was to flip the turtle over and attack its underbelly. It was not the best of plans, but it was the only one Renjiro could come up with at the moment. 
He had already considered attacking Mizuki's head or any of his exposed limbs, but that could force him to retreat back to its shell. Besides being forced to wait for it to come out, Renjiro wouldn't know what to expect as maybe the turtle had a healing mechanism when he retreated back to his shell. If it did then it would eventually undo Renjiro's damage, which was something Renjiro didn't want. While his plan had its own merit, Renjiro had a huge obstacle on his way to a successful execution. That was if he would be able to flip over Mizuki, to expose its underbelly. Renjiro knew that the chains could be strong enough to bind a tailed beast, that too a very strong one, but he did not know if the chains were strong enough to flip a summon of similar size over. In conclusion, Renjiro's plan was mainly faith rather than chance. Now I'm up, so the next step is binding his limbs. Renjiro manifested another four chains and increased their sizes so that they could match the two earlier ones around Mizuki's neck. After the chains increased to an acceptable size, he willed the four to go in opposite directions. Each of them was targeting each of Mizuki's limbs. The four massive chains snaked around with precision along the preordained path of their master, all except one. Renjiro wasn't sure why the chain supposed to get Mizuki's left frontal limb missed its target and actually hit the summon's large, hard shell. Maybe it was the mental fatigue he was accumulating control of the chains that was finally getting to him. Boom! The sound of chain and shell colliding reverberated on the battlefield. One hard to know that since Renjiro wanted to bind Mizuki as fast as possible, the chains had to be traveling at high speeds. So when the chain met the shell, the amount of force the chain hit it was strong. The impact was strong enough to cause a significant portion of the turtle's shell to fracture and break away, revealing the vulnerability of Mizuki's formidable defenses as well as his lime skin, much to Renjiro's surprise. Wait, it can do that? Renjiro couldn't help but mutter. His eyes widened in astonishment at the strength of his adamantin chains. You insolent brat! What have you done to my majestic shell? Mizuki cried, still struggling to free himself from Renjiro's chains. Renjiro did not pay attention to the summons cry since his mind was racing as he quickly reassessed his approach. So the shell wasn't as hard as I thought it was. If I can use them to attack the shell, then why not? Trying to flip it over seems more daunting than this. With a steely determination, Renjiro resolved to exploit this newfound weakness, recognizing that any advantage he could gain against his formidable opponent would be crucial in turning the tide of battle in his favor. Renjiro concentrated his chakra once more and summoned forth additional chains of comparable size and stature. With a swift and decisive motion, he lifted the chains and aimed directly at the turtle's shell. Renjiro then began spinning them in a drill motion. He figured that it would help his penetration power. Ohashi may have thought that summoning you would keep him safe or even buy him more time, Renjiro began, but all he's done is provide me with a live target to test my new ability. As the chains hurtled through the air with unparalleled speed and accuracy, Renjiro braced himself for the impact. Boom! The chains hit their mark as holes formed in Mizuki's previously impenetrable shell. My shell? Please stop it. Mizuki filled the area with his loud cries, a shrill sound that reverberated with the force of his anguish, which did not move Renjiro in the slightest. Renjiro continued with his relentless assault on Mizuki's shell driving his chains relentlessly into the weakened shell with each successive blow. The worst thing was that Mizuki couldn't even reverse summon himself because Renjiro's chains were nullifying his chakra. The only thing he could do was lay there while Renjiro was performing open surgery on him. The sight of his shattered shell proved to be too much for Ohashi to bear, and in a desperate bid to his summon, he revoked the summoning. In an instant, Mizuki vanished from sight, leaving behind only the remnants of his broken shell as a testament to the ferocity of Renjiro's assault. Renjiro, who was caught off guard by the abrupt change, lost his balance and tumbled to the ground. Arg! I was actually thinking of letting you go, but now you have to pay for this. Ohashi's expression contorted with a mixture of rage and disbelief. Let's not lie to ourselves, Renjiro chuckled before continuing, the moment you decided to target my eyes was when our fates became sealed. Ing to be me. Renjiro retrieved his staff, separated it into bladed batons and closed the distance between him and Ohashi. Renjiro did not want to waste his ninjutsu on Ohashi as his reserves were already low and he wanted to kill Ohashi with his hands. With him accumulating pure anger and hatred for the shinobi due to the loss of his eye, 
this was something he was going to enjoy. Sharing the same sentiments, Ohashi didn't bother dodging, he simply flared his chakra, finally deciding to use the final card up his sleeve. While Ohashi was sure Mizuki would a long time to recover, and probably sever their summoning contract, he was grateful that the summon had brought him some time to recover. He needed to be in good physical condition to activate his transformation. As Ohashi began transforming, Renjiro paid keen attention and even decided to wait for him to complete it. He had already resolved to end his life, so why would he hurry things? He wanted Ohashi to feel and experience the same anguish he had earlier promised and even given him before his outburst. After Ohashi completed his transformation, Renjiro was clearly disappointed. I knew he was desperate, but was he also this dumb? Ohashi's transformation was silent and not flashy at all. He just closed his eyes, and when he opened them, he was an entirely different person. It was like his state of being and mind changed. This was the very essence of the Kurigane clan that Ohashi belonged to. Originating from the remote corners between the land of earth and wind, they just circled around the two major nations always switching sides. Their nomadic lifestyle and unpredictable nature made them outcasts in the eyes of settled societies, where stability and order reigned supreme. With their unique clan techniques, such as their transformation, they became a major mercenary force in the shinobi world. The basis of their transformation lay in their emotional state, with negative emotions igniting the dormant power within. The angrier they were, the stronger they would get in their transformation. But such power comes at a cost, their control becomes elusive, and the line between friend and foe blurs into insignificance. This was why Ohashi had been refraining from transforming. But now, Renjiro and Ohashi had made an unspoken agreement to go all in. Losses be damned. So Ohashi Kurigain finally completed his clan's special transformation. Ohashi now stood taller than before. His muscles were now more pronounced while his fingers had elongated into razor-sharp claws. Yet, the most striking change lay in the transformation of Ohashi's skin and hair. His once normal tan complexion took on a deep, midnight blue hue, while his hair transformed into a wild mane of jet black strands streaked with vibrant red strands. His transformation is similar to Yugo's, but if it's really what I read in the bingo book about the Kurigain clan, then why did he even bother using it? When Renjiro was a genin, he did not really pay that much attention to the bingo book but that changed when he joined the Kanoha police force a couple of months ago. Fujioka had made it a habit of ensuring his squad members were updated on all the information in the book. This was the reason why Renjiro was aware of the Kurigain special clan technique despite very few Uchiha shinobi coming across them. Anyway, it doesn't matter, this just makes things easier for me. D. Ohashi yelled as he flashed and immediately appeared in front of Renjiro. He then used his claws to swipe at Renjiro, narrowingly missing him as the latter ducked down. He is faster than before, well that's to be expected. Renjiro noted as he used the bladed ends of his batons to stab at Ohashi's ribs. While the attack connected, it didn't go as planned as Ohashi's skin was now more durable that the baton's blade snapped. So the nature chakra is this strong? Ohashi lunged forward to punch Renjiro, but the latter was careful this time to avoid any sort of contact with Ohashi after their previous exchange. Renjiro jumped a few meters back to create distance between the two. Well, this has gone on for far too long. Renjiro focused and with a glance from Renjiro's eye, Ohashi, who was closing in on him to continue with his attacks, froze and fell to his knees. The transformation is fueled by any negative emotions, right? So why would you think it would be a good idea to use when you know I can use Jinjutsu? Renjiro asked rhetorically. Well, these should help you calm down, Renjiro said as he retrieved some seals from his storage seals. He then squatted and placed the advanced chakra drained seal on the kneeling Jounin before him. The seal kicked in quickly absorbing the nature chakra Ohashi was using forcing him to revert back to his previous form. It sucks that the seal only releases the chakra absorbed to the surrounding and does not store it, otherwise, I could have begun experimenting with it. Still, I can ask him how they manipulate nature's chakra. Maybe their clan insights would put me in the right direction of senjutsu. While that would be good, the minute Fujioka and the rest realize that I have an enemy Jounin alive, I will have to give him up. The best thing to do would be to just kill him and then store his body. I would need to learn some Yamanaka clan techniques to learn from his memories. 
Yes, that would be the safest option. But how would I explain my eye situation? After contemplating on the issue for a couple of seconds Renjiro thought, I can just say that I met a Jounin along the way and narrowly escaped. No, let me just say that I was fighting those seven Chunins and a couple of them used their transformation technique. That is more believable. Renjiro then killed Ohashi and the four Chunins he had knocked out. He stored the Chunin's bodies on a separate scroll which he would be handing over to either Tobe or Fujioka. For Ohashi, he placed a scroll on his forehead to preserve his mind. Although the storage seals would perfectly work as intended, he did this as a cautionary measure since he could not risk any of Ohashi's memories deteriorating. After that, Renjiro simply stored his body before sitting down. He was in desperate need of a breather. Not carrying any soldier pills with me was just stupid. I should have known that a day would come when my chakra reserves would be almost depleted. That being said, I need to master the adamantin chains. They are very useful, but they consume too much chakra. I need to consult Kushina on its chakra uses. I also really need to learn medical ninjutsu, so that I can fix my eye as fast as possible. After a while, Renjiro felt that he had gotten enough rest and even some of his chakra had regenerated, so he sued his chakra field in an attempt to locate his squad members. Tobe and Toda are closer, so I should go and meet them. Renjiro flickered to them and was surprised to even find Fujioka there. They were standing in front of a couple of bodies. It wasn't the first time he wasn't able to sense him as his squad leader was the first person he met who was able to perfectly conceal their chakra and presence. Renjiro had tried numerous times to sense him during training, but he couldn't. It was one of the reasons why his sensor abilities increased as was seriously training them to finally be able to sense his squad leader. Renjiro, we were about to start looking for you dash. What happened to your eyes? Fujioka asked when he saw the empty gap on Renjiro's face. I was fighting some Chunins who suddenly transformed. I guess the monsters Kano Tetsuo was referring to were them. Since they were four and they wanted my eyes, but I managed to kill them. Renjiro answered somberly. Do you still have your eye? Toda asked. Yes, I managed to recover it, Renjiro nodded. Then let me have a look at it, Toda said gesturing for Renjiro to give it to him. This caused Renjiro to furrow his brows in apprehension. Why? I want to see if I can help you fix it. Renjiro handed the seal, he had stored his eye in, to Toda. Toda retrieved the eye and after he ascertained its condition he walked closer to Renjiro and inserted it to its previous place in the eye socket. This feels weird. Renjiro thought as Toda's hands started pulsating with a green glow. This continued for a couple of minutes where Toda and Renjiro just stood there. After a couple of minutes, Toda's brows furrowed as he asked, Hmm? It isn't working? As I expected, it doesn't work. I guess this fully confirms the nature of my chakra senu. This means that I really need to learn medical ninjutsu. What do you mean it's not working? Fujioka inquired. I'm trying to heal his eye using medical ninjutsu, but it is not working, Toda reiterated, with a look of confusion etched on his face. Are you sure you are doing everything correctly? Tobe asked. Yes, Tobe I am doing everything correctly. You should know how good my medical ninjutsu is since it has mostly been used on you. Should I just tell them, or should I just act confused? Telling half-truths would be better, but Daichi and Fugaku already know about it, so it is already an open secret. I can just shallowly tell them about the ability, while I hide some of its perks like Jinjutsu immunity. I guess that was to be expected, Renjiro said. Why is it to be expected? Tobe inquired. I have an ability, well more of a condition, where my body cleanses all foreign substances entering it, like chakra and poisons. I call it an ability because it grants me poison immunity, and a condition because I was warned that medical ninjutsu from other people might not work on me. Renjiro explained. Fujioka turned and faced Renjiro, the Chunin's explanation of his condition, or ability as he termed it, piqued his interest. He asked, so you are sure that you have immunity against poisons? That I am not sure as I only tested it against poisons available in Kanoha. I will have to come across a Suna puppet master dealing with poisons to fully know whether the immunity is a full one or a partial one. Renjiro stated. If it is about poisons, then I have a summon who could help Dash, Toda began before he was interrupted by his elder brother. Don't mind him, Renjiro. 
He has always been waiting to test his summon ever since he got it. But that ability, or condition as you said, seems peculiar. If it can cleanse all foreign chakra that enters your body, then can it also give you immunity against Jinjutsus? Well, that was quick. How should I answer? While Renjiro was thinking of ways to skirt out of that question, Fujioka said, that's enough, Tobe. Everyone is allowed to keep some information about their abilities private. You all know how much private information is powerful enough to end battles before they even begin. That's the least I can do, I was the one who pushed for this mission which resulted in him losing his eye. While that wasn't much of a loss if Renjiro doesn't quickly learn basic medical ninjutsu, then it will become a permanent loss. Let's just hope it doesn't come to that. Fujioka thought. After receiving a knowing glance from his squad leader, Tobe and Tota relented as Renjiro released a sigh of relief. He was glad that he did not have to answer that. But if you can't be healed, how do we help you, because your injury can cost us if enemies attack the village again, Fujioka said. Renjiro is already injured, so it is best for us to return back to the village, Tota suggested. Fujioka shook his head as he said, we can't do that, if it was normal rogue shinobi attacking Ishige Kyur, then we would have completed the mission. But considering the Kurigain clan was involved, we can't just let this be. Then we can stay while Renjiro goes back to the village, Tobe suggested. I will be going back to the village alone? That's great. It will be the first time since I arrived in this world that I will be left unsupervised outside of Kanoha. I can even fast track some of my plans like creating hideouts outside of the villages. I can even use my eye loss as an excuse to arrive later than expected. While Renjiro was still thinking of his future plans, Fujioka was still pondering about Tobe's suggestion. As a first rank officer, Tobe was basically Fujioka's right hand man. Did any of you manage to get any information about this operation from the people who you fought against? Fujioka suddenly inquired. The only thing that I know is that they were from the Kurigane clan and one of the Chunins that I fought mentioned that their mission was to cause as much harm to the village and then leave, Renjiro stated. Can I have their bodies? Fujioka asked. Why does he want their bodies? Yes you can, Fujioka-sama, Renjiro wondered as he took the scrolls that contained the bodies of the seven Kurigane Chunins he fought at and handed them to his squad leader. Once Fujioka got the scrolls he quickly retrieved the seven bodies, arranging them in a particular order in front of everybody. After doing so, Fujioka closed his eyes, knelt and made a hand sign. Hey, Tota! What is Fujioka-sama doing? Renjiro tugged Tota's cloth and asked in a low voice. You don't know? Tota replied with a confused expression. It was only after he realized that they had had few missions since Renjiro joined the squad that he replied, he is reading their memories. Hearing that Renjiro instinctively panicked. Reading their memories? I should have considered that the Uchiha already copied some techniques from other clans of Konoha. I just hope he doesn't figure out that there is a missing Jounin body. Renjiro hoped. After a few minutes went by, Fujioka got up to his feet from his position and stored the bodies back. All they knew was that this was a mission assigned to the clan. I guess we will need to also study the memories of the Jounins to get more details, Fujioka stated while stroking his chin. Who? Renjiro sighed internally. That was a close call, thank the heavens that he chose to read the memories of one of the Chunin's Ohashi knocked out, then it means that the request either came from IWA or Suna, but you never know with the Kurigane clan then only offer their services to the highest bidder, so it could even be another power that put them up to this, Tobe added. And knowing them, once they realize that they have lost some of their shinobi, they will attack again, Fujioka agreed. Then we can request for reinforcements from the village, Renjiro added. Creasing his brows, Fujioka said, yes, we need to do so. Tota will leave with Renjiro and head towards the village and request for reinforcements while Tobe and I remain back to help Ishigekure for as long as possible before the reinforcement arrives. While Fujioka was also aware of the politics involved with the administrative duties of the village, especially when it came to the police force and village council, he was sure they would see the bigger picture and promptly send reinforcements their way. Well, there goes the opportunity one had. I hope that I do get time to build those hideouts before the next war. That would be a key component for my next plans. Renjiro thought. Turning to one of the second rank officers in his squad, Fujioka remarked, 
I am sure I can trust you Tota to pass on my request to everyone back on base, right? Best believe it. I will not let you down Fujioka-sama. Tota said with a low bow. Impressed, Fujioka wanted to say something before Kano Tetsuo's arrival attracted everyone's attention. Once again, thank you, Fujioka, Kano Tetsuo thanked the Kanoha Police Force squad leader for their help against their assailants. Although more damage was done to the village this time to the village, there were fewer casualties for both the shinobi present and Ishigekure civilians. This was largely due to the fact that Fujioka and his squad shouldered the burden of going against the enemy shinobis. This, in turn, enabled Ishigekure shinobi to focus on evacuating their civilians to safety. I already told you Tetsuo, you don't need to thank us because it was our duty. Besides, you already said that this was their most devastating attack, so I am sure the Kurigane clan is going to attack again. Especially since they lost some of their shinobi. Indeed. Fortunately, most of the civilians had already got out of the village due to the chain of constant attacks. The few who were remaining are already on their way to safety. So, the village will be abandoned? Tobask perplexed. No, this was a directive from Lord Third, Fujioka began, we have to prioritize the civilians. The village can be rebuilt, but if the civilians die, then there is no remedy for that. I am sure Lord Hokage already saw through this, but what are the intentions of IWA and Suna? It is clear that one of them was behind this attack. We have only recently begun our period of peace after the last war, so are they doing all this? Do they want to begin another war? I surely hope that there won't ever be another war like the last two ones, we already lost too many comrades. Fujioka sighed in regret. Fujioka had been fortunate enough to survive the last shinobi war which was very devastating. He had first-hand experience with the effects of war both as a shinobi and also as a civilian since the first one happened when he was only a child, Fujioka craved peace more than anything in life. He had recently gotten his second child, another boy, so Fujioka wanted to live long enough to even see the offspring of his offspring. However, Fujioka feared that if another war broke out, then his chances of surviving would be lower than before. While it was true that being weak would only make you fodder and your survival chances would be minimal, the same was also true for those who were stronger than average. Fujioka had been a chunin during the Second Shinobi War, which meant he was pretty much near the middle of the food chain. This gave him this peculiar perspective of war. Being strong meant that you would be expected to shoulder more responsibilities such as being put in riskier situations due to your high chances of making it alive. It also meant that enemy villages would also target you due to the same fact. It was literally a loose-loose situation. This was the main reason why Fujioka's vigor in ascending the shinobi ranks dropped over the last few years with him only recently being promoted to the jounin rank. This did not, in any way, mean that Fujioka was not committed to his duties in the Kanoha police force. While Fujioka, Tobe and Kano Testuo were discussing the current situation, Tobe and Renjiro were making their final for their journey back to the village. While I knew Fujioka was strong since he was a bona fide squad leader, defeating all these jounins just puts him on a whole other level. Seven jounins who could use their transformations like Ohashi puts them a brush over the level of average Kanoha shinobi. Judging from the marks on their body, he most probably used brute force on them and not Jinjutsu which was the safer route. It seems I still have a long way ahead of me because after experiencing Ohashi's improved speed and strength after his transformation, I don't think I would have survived without resorting to Jinjutsu. So how did you guys finish off the jounins you faced? Rinjiro inquired turning to Tota and initiating eye contact. Meh, Tota shrugged before continuing, we were lucky that only one of the three jounins we faced used their transformation. He only did that after he witnessed his comrades dying. After exchanging attacks we quickly realized that he was vulnerable mentally and we changed our tactics to Jinjutsu. While that helped end things sooner, I am still sure that Tobe and I would have still sorted out things even without using Jinjutsu, Tota said with a wide smile covering his face. Welp, so basically the same as me. But I guess a win is still a win regardless of the circumstances surrounding it. Renjiro surmised. Before I forget you should you this, Tota said as he reached over to the pouch on his waist where he retrieved a seal. Before Renjiro could even wonder what he would receive, Tota flicked his wrist and a roll of bandages appeared on his hand. What's this for? 
Renjiro asked. It's for your head, you should wrap it around your head because your empty eye socket is getting annoying to look at. Renjiro did not hesitate in doing so because he too was feeling weird walking around with an empty eye socket. It felt like walking around with an open zipper, but every time you look down to confirm, you find it closed. You could feel it open, but the fact was that it was closed. It was a really disconcerting feeling. As Renjiro was keenly wrapping the bandage on his head and over his missing eye, he sensed, or rather felt a subtle shimmer in them. Spreading his senses, he realized that the bandages Tota handed to him were imbued with chakra. Looking up to Tota for some explanation, the latter said, they are chakra imbued with chakra to ensure that they continuously stimulate your cells and improve your healing. Though the improvement is far much lower than what basic medical ninjutsu can do, it still helps. Are you sure you want me to have this? It won't do much for me considering my condition, Renjiro remarked. Yeah, yeah, I know. But we are in the same squad, so it doesn't matter. Renjiro then continued wrapping the bandages on his head. After finishing up, a wild thought flashed across his mind. Bandages over my head and I still have a sherry gone. I guess I am slowly becoming Danzo. Fujioka then approached the two as they were talking, I have already finished talking to the village chief, so you guys can head back to the village and request for reinforcements. Tota, I expect you to be back with the reinforcements as quickly as possible. With the directives issued, the two did not linger and immediately set off towards Kanoha. While Renjiro was not at his best, the duo took a shorter time to get back to the village than they did when their squad left Kanoha for Ishige Cure. Inasmuch as keen vision was mandatory for the body flicker technique, Renjiro still moved at his fastest speed as his remaining Sharingan made up for his lack of one since the Sharingan only improved the efficiency of the technique. When they arrived at the village, it was already late in the afternoon as the sun was high up in the sky. The village was serene, but Tota and Renjiro could not waste more time due to the sensitive nature of their task. Tota had suggested to Renjiro to go to the hospital and seek help for his eye, but the Chunin refused. He countered that it wouldn't really help and proposed that he join Tota in heading to the base. They both informed their squad captain of the events that unfolded in Ishigekure and after the squad captain became aware of the current situation, he did not bother following the chain of command due to the urgency of the matter and quickly took the two second rank officers to Daichi's office. Once they knocked and were allowed in, Renjiro was surprised to find his aunt present in the office talking to Daichi. In the heart of Kanoha's military police force. Achiha Daichi, the stern and respected chief of police, sat behind his meticulously organized desk, his sharp eyes fixed on Achiha Miwa, a skilled jounin from his clan. Miwa, how did your investigation go? Daichi asked with his tone measured and precise. Daichi-sama, I discovered that there have been several unusual chakra signatures around the area. But there is something more, sinister about these patterns. It's as if they are deliberately avoiding detection. Daichi's brow furrowed, this aligns with the recent reports we have been getting about increased suspicious movements. We must be vigilant. Knock. 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 Just then, a knock on the door interrupted their conversation. Daichi's eyes snapped to the door, who is it, he asked. It's Achiha Sonoda, came the muffled response from the other side of the door. Daichi's frown deepened. He was about to dismiss Sonoda, considering the sensitivity of their discussion, but Sonoda's voice cut through his thoughts. It is an emergency, Daichi-sama. With a sigh, Daichi nodded to Miwa and then called out, you may enter. The door swung open to reveal Achiha Sonoda, a squad captain with a reputation for his keen instincts, and Renjiro and Toda. Sonoda had short, spiky hair and dark circles under his eyes that hinted at long hours of relentless duty. He stepped into the room after the Chunins, closing the door behind him. Renjiro's presence immediately drew concern from Daichi and Miwa as they saw the bandages covering Renjiro's left eye. Daichi's sharp eyes narrowed, Renjiro, what happened, he asked. Miwa's reaction was more immediate and emotional. Her eyes widened, and she stepped forward, Renjiro, your eye. What happened during your mission? The sadness in her tone was unmistakable. Renjiro was her only living relative so seeing him injured was not a feeling she could easily stomach. I knew at some point that I would have to explain the situation to Miwa, but I didn't think it would be this soon. Anyway, this is going to take a while. 
Renjiro sighed inwardly. Renjiro managed a reassuring smile. I'm fine. During the mission, we encountered Shinobi from the Kurigane clan attacking Ishigekure. I managed to defeat all the Chunins I faced, but when a Jounin arrived, I had to quickly escape. The Jounin wanted my eyes, but I luckily escaped with both of them although one of them had been forcefully removed. Miwa's expression tightened with a mix of sorrow and anger. She reached out, gently touching Renjiro's arm. Renjiro, I'm so sorry. Is your left eye safely stored? Of course, Miwa was aware of Renjiro's chakra senu so she wasn't confused why he hadn't used medical ninjutsu to fix his eye. Renjiro was not quite sure he had the chakra purification ability Kushina as while the abilities were mostly the same, it was possible for them to have subtle differences. So he chose to wait and tick off all the characteristics for confirmation. Although the ability the boy got from his Uzumaki genes is really good as it gives him immunity against Jinjutsus, the drawbacks are making me wonder if it is really worth it. Daichi mused as he understood Renjiro's current predicament. While that was true since Powerful could be near immune to Jinjutsu, with the exception of Powerful ones like the Infinite Tsukuyami, the fact that it negated the help of medical ninjutsu while fighting made it more of a disadvantage to most shinobi. Of course, most shinobi were not like Renjiro who had an improved regeneration, a fact that he had chosen to keep from Daichi and Fugaku after seeing their reactions when he revealed his chakra senu. Renjiro nodded his head, yes, I already stored it and I am now waiting to fix it. Meanwhile, Sonoda was confused as he could vaguely understand what was going on. He already has his missing eye, so why did he not use medical ninjutsu to fix it? He thought. Daichi, although deeply concerned, knew he had to keep the focus on the matter at hand. Renjiro, it is good that you aren't severely injured but why am I only half of your squad here? Seeing the opportunity, Sonoda decided to answer, Renjiro and Toda came to me with crucial information about their mission. As Renjiro already mentioned, they encountered Shinobi from the Kurigane clan. Since Fujioka and his squad managed to thwart the attack, Fujioka and his assistant remained behind and sent these two to request reinforcements as he was sure the Kurigane clan was going to retaliate. That was the right decision because either IWA or Suna put them up to this. So we have to handle this with care. But who am I going to send? Daichi's expression darkened, his mind racing as he absorbed the information. Sonoda, Miwa will lead the reinforcements, I want you to work with her and mobilize a squad that will support her. Miwa, who had been listening intently, nodded. Thank you Daichi-sama, it has been a long since I fought anyone, so this will be a great time to vent out my anger. While Renjiro and Toda were giving their report on the result of their skirmish with the Kurigane clan, a similar situation was happening a couple of hundred miles away. In the dimly lit cave, the flickering light from a lone torch cast long, dancing shadows on the rough stone walls. The air was thick with the smell of damp earth and the faint echo of dripping water. From the ground, a figure emerged, the movement almost seamless as if the earth itself had given birth to him. The figure's body was split into two halves, with the right side being completely white and resembling plant-like bark or roots, while the left side is black and more fluid. Surrounding his head was a large, Venus flytrap-like structure that could open and close, enhancing his plant-like and otherworldly appearance. As it fully materialized, it glanced around the cave, ensuring they were alone. Another figure, shrouded in a similar dark cloak, awaited him deeper within the cavern. Despite the advanced age of the second figure, they still exuded a powerful and menacing aura. Their long, wild hair was grey cascading down his back and framing his stern, weathered face. It's about time, the second figure said, his voice a low, raspy voice. The first figure nodded respectfully. I apologize for the delay. Have they made a move? The second figure asked. Yes, Kanoha sent a team that thwarted a wave of attack. From what I heard, they are about to send more shinobi to protect Ishigekure. The second figure let out a low chuckle, as expected, are they going to more Achiha? Most likely. Everything is proceeding as planned. Our time to move again will soon be upon us. Continue to monitor the situation closely and report any further developments immediately. The first figure bowed slightly, a gesture of respect and acknowledgement. Understood. I will keep you informed. With that, the first figure sank back into the ground, 
disappearing as swiftly and silently as he had appeared. The second figure remained by the cave, contemplating the available options before him. A slash N, Madara was still alive at this time and it did not make any sense for him to just be silent and not make any moves, so I decided that he would have a part to play pre-third shinobi war. It was already late in the evening when Renjiro left the base. Miwa, Sonoda, Toda and other officers were already on their way heading to Ishigekure. Renjiro did not join them for obvious reasons and was given time to rest. The mental fatigue had been accumulating, and needed to be remedied. Entering his home, Renjiro felt a momentary sense of peace. He moved through the house methodically, locking the door behind him, and headed to his bedroom. Renjiro sat on the edge of his bed, feeling the weight of the day's events pressing down on him. He reached up and slowly began to unwind the bandages from around his head. The coarse material fell away, revealing his left eye, or rather, where his left eye had been. He hesitated for a moment, then stood and walked over to the mirror on the wall. As his reflection came into view, Renjiro's breath was caught in his throat. As the last of the bandages came off, Renjiro looked at his reflection. His breath caught in his throat. Where he expected to see a hollow, empty socket or a scarred mess, he saw something entirely different. What does this mean? Renjiro asked in confusion. His left eye socket, which was supposed to be empty, had something in it. There was an almost translucent scara present, with a deep, swirling crimson red marking in the middle that Renjiro immediately thought was a maturing iris. Is my left eye growing back? Renjiro stared, unable to comprehend what he was seeing. He leaned closer to the mirror, inspecting the eye with a mixture of awe and confusion. He reached up and gently touched the skin around it, half expecting it to disappear like an illusion, but it remained. This, this can't be, he whispered to himself. Maybe my mental fatigue and remaining eye are playing games on me. I need to have a rest. Renjiro was so shocked that he couldn't even process what was going on. His brain was already on autopilot because he was tired as hell, so he decided to half believe what he was seeing. This wasn't just a simple injury. It was something more extreme. Whatever had happened, it was beyond his immediate understanding. Renjiro took a deep breath, trying to calm his racing thoughts. He needed rest, but he also needed answers. Deciding that rest was the priority, he resolved to investigate this new development first thing in the morning. He moved back to his bed and lay down, closing his eyes and willing himself to relax. The exhaustion of the day finally took over, and Renjiro fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. Early in the next morning, Renjiro got up at the crack of dawn. He could vaguely remember what happened the previous night. Once it all came back to him like a dream, Renjiro briskly got up and walked over to the nearest mirror. He had to confirm if he was dreaming or not. I guess I wasn't dreaming at all, Renjiro remarked as he stared at his reflection in the mirror. Since he had not put the bandages back on the previous night, it was easy for Renjiro to confirm that what he saw was indeed real and he was not dreaming. But how is this possible? Renjiro wondered. Was this caused by my regeneration abilities? It can't be. Kushina only said that it only improves the healing speed of minor wounds like cuts. It should not be able to regenerate a body part. Wait, what this why I was so tired? I mean, I had fought using my chains, which was hard since it was a new experience for me, leading me to be mentally tired. But maybe a part that contributed to the mental exhaustion was my body channeling resources to regenerate a new eye. All in all, this is crazy because even while Madara was able to instantly heal after he got Hashirama cells, he did not regenerate a whole other eye. Or maybe he did not do so because the need never arose. Maybe I have also never explored the limits of my regeneration. Renjiro walked over to a seat a couple of steps from him and sat. He needed to sit as his mind was racing with countless possibilities after what he just found out. But being able to regenerate another eye is broken. I can basically decide to keep removing my eyes and accumulate Sharingans and go the Danzo way. I can learn the Uchiha clan's forbidden jutsu such as the Izanagi and Izanami which would make me near immortal. Sigh. But it isn't that straightforward, Renjiro muttered in a low voice. Danzo had Hashirama's cells implanted by Orochimaru which brought some balance to that equation. So while he couldn't control the Sharingans and deactivate them, the Hashirama cells he had helped him meet the high chakra consumption rate required that having them did not affect his normal life even when he was fighting. 
While the cells greatly helped him, they were also a double-edged sword. Once Danzo lost a majority of the Sharingans due to the constant use of the Izanagi, the balance was broken and the cells became erratic doing more harm than good. There was also the possibility that the seal on his arm that he unlocked his arm before the battle might be keeping the Sharingan drain to minimal levels. But we also know how secret of freak Danzo was, maybe it was to keep his arm sealed or destroyed in case he died or lost his arm. While I am sure I would have to use less chakra since I am already in possession of two Sharingans. Scratch that, two and a half Sharingans since the one on my left eye is still growing. But I am still not sure whether I could handle the less chakra required without it straining my current self. Rinjiro flicked his wrist which was holding the seal he had stored his Sharingan in and retrieved it. He then picked up a jar which was full of a grayish liquid and put the eye in it. This was something Toda had advised him to do and the liquid was chakra water that ensured his eye was in optimal condition. The other thing that this method edged out the option of using storage seals was that it ensured that his visual dojitsu did not degrade. Renjiro then stored the jar in a storage seal as he could not risk leaving it behind in his home. With the village council beginning to antagonize the Uchiha clan as well as Daichi and Fugaku becoming wary of him, the eye might just disappear into thin air. The only options I can think of to skirt around the whole chakra consumption issue is to either bank on the growth of my chakra reserves, which has been explosive since the Magatama, or learn Tsunade's strength of a hundred seals jutsu. The jutsu requires me to store vast amounts of chakra over an extended amount of period of time in a specific point of their body. I can just reroute the storage to where I plan on implating the eyes. That could probably work. I could also use the spare sets of eyes and awaken the Mangekyo twice to gain an eternal Mangekyo, right? The eyes are technically related since they come from one person. But awakening the Mangekyo only once is a tall order and a pariah due to the negative emotions required. Only one person has ever gotten their Mangekyo through positive emotions, which I don't think is possible for me since the bonds I have formed as more or less loose. I don't even know why I am thinking too far into the future when I don't even know how long my eye will take to completely regenerate. It could be weeks or even months before it does. If it takes long, I will need to adjust my plans. Getting up and preparing for the day, Renjiro said, while beginning my lessons on medical ninjutsu is important, I need to check in with Kushina and ask if she knows any technique that I could use to improve my passive regeneration to hasten the process of my eye healing. If she doesn't then I can always start learning medical ninjutsu. So that's what happened. Kushina remarked as she pursed her lips. Renjiro had gone to Kushina's residence as planned and brought her up to speed with what happened on his mission to Ishige Cure. He awakened the ability faster than I expected. Did the stressful situation hasten the process? Regardless, I need to add that to my notes. Kushina's mind raced. What Renjiro had just revealed to her made her go through a roller coaster of emotions. She was happy at first when she learned that he had awakened another chakra Senu, especially one that she was well versed in. But the moment she understood the story behind the bandages Renjiro currently had on his head, a pang of sadness hit Kushina at her core. They were still exploring the depths of his first chakra Senu, the chakra purification ability, so while it was good to finally confirm it, Experiencing the limits in quick succession left a bitter taste in their mouth. While it's good that you have awakened the chains, you need to focus on medical fuenjutsu so that you can return to your best. I am sure that your squad will be waiting for you. Kushina explained as she leaned back on the chair she was sitting on. Actually, that was part of the reason I came to see you today, but first I need to show you something. Show me what? Kushina asked as her brows creased with concern. When I removed my bandages after returning to the village, I found something about my left eye. Kushina's eyes widened slightly, but she remained calm. What do you mean when you removed the bandages, didn't you say that you already stored your eye? Instead of explaining, Renjiro carefully removed the bandages, revealing his translucent scara, which had gotten lighter than the last time Renjiro checked, and the crimson circle in the middle of it. Kushina leaned in, examining it closely. Her expression was a mixture of awe and concern. That's, incredible, she said softly. So your eye is already regenerating? Of course, Rinjiro had some reservations about letting Kushina know about this after the whole situation with Daichi and Fugaku. But after spending more time thinking about it, he decided to take the risk. 
he had already resigned himself to the fact that he would need to work harder than before to become so strong that even when people started scheming against him, it wouldn't be a threat. Renjiro nodded. Yes, which is strange as I did not think my enhanced healing was this potent. Wait, how long ago was your eye removed? Kushina inquired. Around four days ago, Renjiro replied after taking a moment to think about it. That soon? I've never seen anyone with such fast healing when it came to regenerating body parts, apart from the first Hokage, but he was an exception. His healing ability is more potent than expected. Is this because I used the tailed beast chakra during the Magatama process? If it is, then his healing will only get stronger as time goes. Seeing the contemplative look on Kushina's face, Rinjiro asked, what is on your mind? Should I tell him? Kushina pondered. I think I might have miscalculated how strong your healing would be, Kushina began as her expression turned serious, usually the Magatama process was conducted by the clan elders so that their chakra could activate the dormant Uzumaki genes responsible for chakra sanus. I also did the same, but I might have used the Nine Tails chakra by accident. But isn't his chakra so potent? Will I experience severe side effects? Rinjiro asked in quick succession. Kushina shook her head, on the contrary, I think it is the reason why your healing is stronger than average. The potency of the Ninetales chakra would have only improved the process. At least, I hope it did. Kushina muttered the last part hoping Renjiro wouldn't hear it. Renjiro felt a wave of relief wash over him. He heard Kushina's last statement, but his mind focused on something else, is that why my eyes were burning during the process? But if the Ninetailed Beast Chakra was channeled to my eyes, wouldn't it have already changed by now? Shrugging the thoughts away, Renjiro asked, Do you know of a way to already fasten my healing since it is more passive as of now? Kushina's eyes twitched as her face contorted to disgust. Are you serious? Did I say something by accident? Renjiro wondered as he could sense the mood of the room had shifted. He could sense that it was darker than before. Yes? Renjiro answered, not sure if that was the best thing to do. Kushina took a deep breath before answering in a low tone, Renjiro, I have just to you how your healing is better than expected and you are still asking for ways to improve it? Kushina's voice reached a crescendo as Renjiro instinctively flickered a couple of meters back. Are you that shameless? Kushina thundered as the chain she flanged hit the spot where Renjiro was standing a few moments ago. You know what? I just remembered that I have to visit the hospital for my medical fuinjutsu lesson. So I will see you later. Renjiro immediately flickered out of the room leaving Kushina at a loss for words. I already overlooked that when he asked to help him awaken another chakra senu, but no it is becoming too much. Kushina thought. Sigh. I need to get back to my seals, Kushina muttered. I really don't know why she reacted that way, it was only a question. Renjiro, who had appeared on a street in Kanoha, said. Anyway, Kushina probably got angry because she did not know of a way to help me. But why did she resort to calling me shameless, is asking questions shameless nowadays? As the noise of the bustling street of Kanoha drowned his thoughts, Renjiro decided to head to the hospital for his medical ninjutsu classes. As Renjiro walked, he couldn't help but notice a new shop that had recently opened, drawing the attention of many villagers. It had a vibrant banner above the entrance read Ichiraku Ramen, and the inviting aroma of freshly made ramen wafted through the air, tempting passers-by. Rinjiro paused for a moment, a slight smile forming on his lips as he remembered hearing about this place. It was opened by a genin who had chosen to abandon his shinobi career in favor of pursuing his passion for cooking. Maybe I'll give it a try sometime. Rinjiro mused to himself. Continuing his journey, Renjiro soon reached the hospital. Renjiro made his way to the training area, where classes on medical ninjutsu and fuinjutsu were held. To his relief, there was no need to wait for the classes to begin as he was right on time. As he entered the hall where the classes were to be held, Renjiro took a seat among the other students, feeling a mixture of excitement and nervousness. The room was well equipped, with various tools and scrolls neatly arranged on shelves, and diagrams of the human body displayed on the walls. The atmosphere was both scholarly and welcoming, encouraging a sense of focus and curiosity. When the class began, the instructor stepped forward, Good afternoon, everyone, my name is Senju Shizuka. The instructor greeted the class, her voice calm and authoritative. 
Today, we will be focusing on the basics of medical ninjutsu, a crucial skill for any shinobi who wishes to enhance their healing abilities and provide effective support in the field. If you have any questions as we go on, you can ask my group who will help me lead this class. Everyone's focus shifted to the ground standing behind Shizuka. It was a collection of five shinobis, all wearing their flak jackets symbolizing their shinobi rank of jounin and above. When Renjiro sensed them he realized that they were just chunins from the chakra they were subtly exuding. Renjiro also sensed a familiar chakra signature among them. Renjiro listened intently to Shizuka, absorbing every word. When she introduced her team, he hadn't expected to see Aiko here, but her presence was reassuring. It had been close to six months since they both became chunins after which their genin team was dissolved by Riko. From there on, their paths diverged. So, she decided to specialize in medical ninjutsu. It is not what I expected, but it is still exceptional since it helps on the field. Renjiro surmised as their gazes met. Renjiro gave her a nod before he shifted his focus back to the class. As many of you know, Shizuka continued, medical ninjutsu requires precise chakra control and an in-depth understanding of the human body. It allows us to heal injuries, diagnose ailments, and even perform complex surgeries in the field. The first technique that we will focus on is the mystical palm jutsu. Renjiro leaned forward, his interest peaked. He had heard of the mystical palm jutsu but had never fully understood its intricacies. Shizuka continued, the mystical palm jutsu is a vital skill for any medical nin. It is used to stimulate the body's natural healing process. By channeling chakra into the patient's body, we can accelerate their healing, repair tissues, and even mend broken bones. The explanation caused Renjiro to raise a brow. This is exactly what I wanted to know from Kushina. Even if it won't be permanent, just stimulating my healing process would be enough for me. Shizuka continued with the lecture which was informative as it dispelled a lot of Renjiro's thoughts as well as gave him more insights when it came to medical fuinjutsu. After a while, Shizuka pulled out a scroll and unrolled it on the table in front of her. She formed a quick series of hand signs, and a fish appeared, lying on the table. The fish was still, clearly injured. To give you a practical demonstration, Shizuka explained, I'll use this injured fish. Watch closely. Renjiro immediately focused and activated his Sharingan. He did not want to miss anything that Shizuka would do. She formed the hand signs for the mystical palm jutsu, her hands glowing with a soft green light. Of course, Shizuka had already mastered the jutsu, so she only used the hand signs for the sake of her students, something that Renjiro appreciated as he quickly memorized the hand signs. Gently, Shizuka placed her hands over the fish, and the green light seemed to seep into its body. The whole class watched in awe as the fish began to move, its injuries slowly healing before their eyes. The key to this technique, Shizuka said, not taking her eyes off her work, lies in precise chakra control. Too much chakra and you could cause harm, essentially burning the fish, too little, and the healing will be ineffective. The chakra she is using seems different. Renjiro thought as he watched intently, his eyes was fixed on the green glow emanating from Shizuka's hands. The whole concept seemed straightforward, but he knew that mastering the technique would require practice and a deep understanding of chakra control. After a few moments, the fish was fully healed, and it began swimming energetically in a small basin of water that Shizuka had placed on the table. She is using Yang Release Chakra, which makes sense since the physical energy is important to stimulate the body's natural healing process. But the chakra seems devoid of any chakra nature, which will be hard to copy. Now, Shizuka said, turning to the class, I want each of you to practice the mystical palm jutsu yourselves. My assistants will provide each of you with a seal containing an injured fish. Focus on maintaining a steady flow of energy. Remember, control is crucial. Shizuka's team of assistants moved around the room, distributing small scrolls to each student. Aiko was the one who personally handed Renjiro his seal. Renjiro, she said with a hint of a smile and concern, I didn't expect to see you here. What is wrong with your eye? Something happened during I mission I was recently on, fortunately, it is already healing. That's why I decided to learn medical fuinjutsu even if it is basic techniques so that if this happens again I can quickly fix it, Renjiro briefly explained as he was pointing to the bandages on his head. Aiko nodded, that's a wise decision. If you need any extra help, don't hesitate to ask. 
Thank you, Aiko. I will do so. Aiko went on her way as she still had to distribute the scroll containing fish to other students in class. Renjiro received his scroll and unrolled it on the table in front of him. He formed a hand sign and an injured fish appeared before him. He did not hesitate and promptly began his practice. Renjiro formed the hand signs for the mystical palm jutsu and concentrated, feeling the familiar surge of chakra flowing through him. He directed it to his hands, willing it to take on the same green glow he had seen from Shizuka. Aiko, who was that boy that you were talking to? Shizuka questioned once her assistants had finished distributing the seals. He is Uzumaki Renjiro, we were in the same genin team, Aiko replied. What is wrong with his eye? Shizuka inquired. He told me that he was injured during a mission he was in, Aiko replied. Renjiro had already caught Shizuka's attention with the bandages he had on his head. The fact that her assistant spent time, even if it was brief, talking to him, only made Shizuka more interested in him. Why is it hard? Renjiro muttered in frustration. At first, his control wavered, the green light flickering and unstable. This frustrated Renjiro since he was proud of the progress he had made in his chakra control. But it seemed he still had room for improvement. Renjiro did not give up and with each attempt, Renjiro felt his confidence grow. Slowly, steadily, the green glow stabilized. Renjiro placed his glowing hands over the fish, channeling his chakra into the injured creature. At first, everything seemed to be going well. He watched as the fish's movements became more lively, its injuries starting to heal. However, he soon noticed something alarming. A small part of the fish's skin began to redden and burn, causing him to quickly pull back his chakra. Seems like I used too much chakra. Renjiro thought. Careful, Shizuka's voice came from behind him as she echoed Renjiro's thoughts, you need to regulate your chakra output. Too much can cause harm, just as we discussed. Renjiro nodded and tried again, this time he was more mindful of the amount of chakra he used. As he reduced the flow, he felt an unexpected resistance from the fish's body. It was as if the fish was pushing back against his chakra, making it harder to maintain a steady flow. The resistance makes sense, my chakra is invading its body. I just need to find the right amount of chakra that would reduce the resistance I am facing as well as not burn the fish. It is our first session and he is already using Yang release. Is he talented or did he know about it before? Shizuka, who was paying close attention to Renjiro's progress, thought. Determined, Renjiro focused harder. He incrementally increased his chakra, but each time he did, the burning on the fish's skin resumed, forcing him to pull back once more. What am I doing wrong? Renjiro muttered. Frustration began to set in, but Renjiro reminded himself of Shizuka's words. Control was crucial. He closed his eyes for a moment, and then tried again, this time with a gentler, more controlled approach. But the result was still the same as before. You are adding a chakra nature to the chakra you are using, Shizuka commented. Renjiro was startled by Shizuka's sudden appearance but quickly composed himself. What do you mean? Renjiro asked. While it is commendable that you are already using Yang release chakra, the chakra you use to stimulate the body's cells needs to be neutral, Devoid of any chakra nature, Shizuka began, when you began practicing your ninjutsu and the various chakra natures, you had to be mindful of the chakra you wanted to use and convert your chakra to that nature. Shizuka paused before continuing, since you are not converting your chakra to any chakra nature, you are subconsciously using chakra imbued by your predominant chakra nature. Why didn't think of that? Rinjiro caught on to what Shizuka implied. But how do I use this neutral chakra that you are talking about? Renjiro questioned. I can't tell you that, as it is the essence of medical ninjutsu. Shizuka smiled before continuing, once you figure that out, this whole exercise and medical ninjutsu as a whole will become easier for you. Shizuka turned to the rest of the class and clapped her hands to draw everyone's attention, that is it for today's class. I am happy to see that you are all making good progress. Keep practicing, and don't hesitate to ask for help if you need it. We will meet here tomorrow for our next class. Using the neutral chakra that Shizuka mentioned was far much easier talking about it than it was achieving it. It was basically the reversal of what happened when one performed a basic elemental jutsu like the water blast jutsu. Where one would need to convert their chakra to a water chakra nature, 
If it wasn't their chakra affinity, medical ninjutsu required one to ensure their chakra did not have any chakra nature in it. So Renjiro had to first unlearn all of the previous habits he had formed when practicing basic ninjutsu and be conscious of the process for him to start showing any progress. He needed to consciously separate his chakra from any elemental influence and focus on its pure, neutral form. This proved to be a daunting task. Renjiro took a deep breath to steady himself and tried again. This time he was more mindful of the amount of chakra he used. As he reduced the flow, he felt the expected resistance from the fish's body. He visualized his chakra as a calm, steady stream, flowing gently into the fish's body. The resistance he felt was still there, but he adjusted his output carefully, trying to match the fish's natural energy. Slowly, he began to see improvement. The redness faded, and the fish's injuries continued to heal without the burning effect. Finally, Rinjiro thought as a small smile of satisfaction plastered his face. He was getting the hang of it. It only took him his fourth session for him to finally start showing progress. The number of fish he had roasted over the last three days in an attempt to heal them was ungodly. Yet, with each mistake, he learned something new about the delicate balance required. Well done, Renjiro, Shizuka complimented him after observing his successful attempt, remember, medical ninjutsu is not just about using chakra. It's about understanding the body's natural processes and working in harmony with them. You've made significant progress. Keep practicing, and you'll continue to improve. Renjiro nodded. He continued to practice, the mystical palm jutsu becoming more familiar with each attempt. Only performing it once wasn't good enough. He needed to master the jutsu to the extent that he could perform it flawlessly, without the need to use any hand signs. By the end of that session, Renjiro's chances of flawlessly performing the mystical palm jutsu improved from once in 10 tries to 7 in 10 tries. Unfortunately, Renjiro could not perform the mystical palm jutsu without using any hand signs. He had reduced the sign to only one which was enough for now. His control had also improved becoming precise, and he no longer experienced the resistance or burning effects that had plagued his earlier attempts. Renjiro demonstrated his progress to Shizuka, who watched with a keen eye. She smiled approvingly as he healed the fish flawlessly, his hands emitting a steady green light. His control is impeccable. I would have found it hard to believe that he was just struggling with it a couple of days ago if I wasn't here to witness it. Excellent work, Renjiro, Shizuka praised. Keep honing your skills, and you'll become an exceptional medical nin. Only after a majority of the class mastered the mystical palm jutsu on the fish, did Shizuka decide it was time to progress to the next stage of their training. This involved practicing the jutsu on human beings, albeit in a controlled and safe manner. Shizuka gathered the students together, explaining the next phase of their training. Now that you've demonstrated proficiency with the mystical palm jutsu on the fish, it's time to apply your skills to human anatomy. However, we will start slowly and cautiously. Are we going to use it on one another? Renjiro wondered. The class listened intently as Shizuka outlined the procedure. For practice purposes, each of you will make shallow cuts on your skin. This will simulate minor injuries that you will then heal using the mystical palm jutsu. Cut ourselves? Isn't that dangerous? Someone in the class complained. Yeah, what if we fail to heal it and bleed out? Another also complained. They are all shinobis, why are they acting as if shallow cuts and life-ending wounds? Yes, it was an unorthodox and potentially dangerous method of learning, but he decided to trust Shizuka's judgment. Following Shizuka's instructions, the students carefully made shallow cuts on their skin, ensuring they were superficial and would heal quickly. Once the cuts were made, they focused their chakra, activating the mystical palm jutsu to heal themselves. Renjiro felt a surge of chakra flow from his hands as he applied the technique to his own wound. The green glow enveloped the cut, and he concentrated on directing the energy to accelerate the healing process. To his relief, he felt the wound close up gradually, the skin knitting back together seamlessly. I succeeded on my first try. As Renjiro glanced around the room, he saw his classmates performing the technique with varying degrees of success. Some struggled initially, their concentration faltering, but with encouragement and practice, they soon adapted to the new challenge. Though I am not sure whether I stimulated my natural healing, or if my healing kicked in to heal the cut. 
Determined to test this theory, Renjiro decided to take a risk. With a steady hand and focused mind, Renjiro made deeper cuts on his skin than the superficial ones instructed by Shizuka. The cuts were still controlled and not overly deep, but they were enough to cause moderate bleeding and require a significant amount of healing. Activating the mystical palm jutsu, Renjiro directed his chakra towards the wounds, channeling it with precision. The green glow enveloped his hands as he focused intently on accelerating the healing process. To his relief, he felt the wounds close up at a faster rate than before, indicating that the jutsu was indeed effective even when dealing with more severe injuries. It actually feels better than I expected as it gives off a soothing feeling. I guess that comes in handy when dealing with injured patients. Considering he had incurred a major wound when he blocked Ohashi's sword with his hands and it still healed, Renjiro decided to push the boundaries further. Can I use it on my eye? No, I will just wait until class ends, so that I can do it at home. There is no need bringing unnecessary attention towards me here. Despite the initial discomfort and uncertainty, the students quickly adapted to using the mystical palm jutsu on themselves. Shizuka closely monitored their progress and offered guidance and support where needed. She was impressed by their resilience and determination, noting the rapid improvement they showed. As the class came to an end, Shizuka commended the students on their progress. Well done, everyone. Healing yourselves may have been a challenging task, but you handled it admirably. Keep up the good work. Renjiro headed home after the class to see whether he could use the mystical palm jutsu on his eye. It was a bold move, considering the delicate nature of the eye and the potential risks involved. His eye was already healing, so Renjiro could do more harm than good. However, Renjiro was willing to take his chances. Renjiro steeled his resolve and focused his chakra on his injured eye. With practice precision, he applied the mystical palm jutsu to the regenerating tissue, willing it to heal at an accelerated pace. A green glow enveloped his eye, and he felt a surge of energy coursing through him as the healing process began. It isn't as easy as I expected, Renjiro thought, using the mystical palm jutsu on his eye was proving to be a challenge unlike any he had faced before. Unlike the previous exercises where he channeled chakra through his hands, this time he had to change the medium of chakra usage from his arms to his mind, controlling the flow with his mental faculties. The process required intense concentration and precise control, as he struggled to synchronize his chakra flow with the natural healing process of his eye. With unwavering determination, Renjiro pressed on, pushing himself to his limits. Slowly but surely, he began to feel a sense of progress. Hours turned into an entire day as Renjiro continued to pour his energy into the task. He remained steadfast in his resolve, refusing to succumb to fatigue or discouragement. And finally, as the sun dipped below the horizon and darkness descended, Renjiro felt a surge of triumph surge through him. Is it done? I think so, with a sense of exhilaration, Renjiro removed his hand from his eye, his heart pounding with anticipation. To his relief and joy, he found that the injured eye had fully regenerated. It was restored to its former strength and vitality. Finally, I have my third Sharingan, Renjiro said as a smirk formed on his face. As the vibrant hues of sunset painted the sky above Kanoha, Senju Shizuka made her way purposefully towards the office of the head of medical ninjutsu. It had been a busy day of training and mentoring aspiring medical nin, but there was one matter that she felt compelled to address with her seniors. Arriving at the door of the head of medical ninjutsu's office, Shizuka paused for a moment to collect her thoughts. With a deep breath, she raised her hand and knocked on the door. A muffled voice from within granted her permission to enter, and Shizuka pushed open the door, stepping into the office. As she entered the office of the head of medical ninjutsu, she was greeted by a woman whose presence commanded respect and admiration throughout the village. It was none other than Senju Tsunade, one of the legendary Sanin known for her monstrous strength and mastery of medical ninjutsu. Tsunade offered a warm smile as she acknowledged Shizuka's presence. Shizuka, what brings you here today, she inquired. Without hesitation, Shizuka cut straight to the chase, Tsunade-sama, I have made a significant discovery during today's medical ninjutsu lessons. I have found a shinobi who possesses exceptional talent and great potential in medical ninjutsu. A talented shinobi? Tsunade's interest was immediately piqued, her expression becoming more attentive as she listened to Shizuka's words. 
Tell me more, she prompted, leaning forward slightly. Shizuka wasted no time in elaborating. The shinobi in question is Uzumaki Renjiro. He has shown remarkable progress in mastering the mystical palm jutsu, far surpassing his peers or anyone I know in a short amount of time. His chakra control and healing abilities are truly remarkable, and I believe that he has the potential to become one of our village's finest medical nin. Tsunade's eyebrows raised slightly in surprise, anyone you know, even me? She asked. Meanwhile, Shizuka simply nodded as she couldn't help but remember the events that occurred the last few days that prompted her to go and see Tsunade. After a majority of the class had mastered the mystical palm jutsu, Shizuka introduced another crucial technique to them, poison extraction and antidote administration. Poison extraction and antidote administration are essential skills for any medical nin, Shizuka explained, during missions, we often encounter situations where swift action is needed to save lives from venomous creatures or poison weapons. Mastering these techniques could mean the difference between life and death for our comrades. There was a significant decrease in the number of students attending her classes recently. It became evident that the majority of them had only signed up to learn the mystical palm jutsu, viewing it as a practical solution to the injuries they might encounter during missions. Which in hindsight was understandable. The more specialized techniques, such as poison extraction and antidote administration, held less appeal to those seeking quick and easy solutions. However, amidst the dwindling numbers, Renjiro still kept attending them. Unlike his peers, Renjiro harbored a keen interest in the antidote administration technique, recognizing its potential importance while fighting. Fujioka and the rest haven't returned, so I have more time to focus on medical ninjutsu. While poison extraction and antidote administering isn't something I would bother learning, considering the nature of my chakra senu, I could still learn it so that I can effectively administer poisons while using my bois, while the poison extraction technique focused on removing toxins from a person's body. Antidote administration centered on the crucial task of administering an antidote to counteract the effects of poison. Perfect chakra control was imperative, as both techniques required delicate manipulation within the intricate network of blood vessels of the target, which was interwoven with their chakra network. Any mistake could lead to severe injury, crippling the shinobi, or in severe cases death. Understanding the risks involved, Shizuka took a cautious approach to teaching her students. She emphasized the necessity of mastering the fundamentals before attempting the advanced applications. Thus, the students began their training by practicing with separating poison from chakra water before even considering doing so on a living being. The students learned to channel their chakra with precision, carefully manipulating the chakra water to extract the poison, which was just a solution added to the chakra water. As they grew more proficient in separating the poison from the chakra water, Shizuka introduced the next step in their training combining the extracted poison with an antidote to form a solution that mimicked the composition of a patient's blood. This exercise was crucial in preparing them for the practical application of antidote administration, requiring them to understand the interactions between poisons and their corresponding antidotes. To the Shizuka's amazement, Renjiro demonstrated a remarkable aptitude for both poison extraction and antidote administration. With precision and skill beyond his years, he flawlessly performed both techniques, mastering them in one or two tries. He makes it seem effortless. I had to practice for a whole month just to separate the poison. He has even learned the techniques faster than Tsunade although that won't be fair to compare since she basically made the technique. Is this what talent really looks like? Shizuka thought as she watched with pride as Renjiro executed the techniques with ease. Shizuka was right, once you learn how to manipulate the neutral chakra the rest becomes easy. It's like breathing in and out. Renjiro thought. Renjiro, Shizuka called out, I must say, your progress is truly remarkable. I've never seen someone grasp these techniques so quickly. This again, Renjiro remarked as he smiled modestly, thank you, Shizuka-sensei. I'm grateful for your guidance and patience. Shizuka paused for a moment, studying Renjiro with a thoughtful expression. You know, Renjiro, you have a natural talent for medical ninjutsu. Have you ever considered becoming a medical nin? She's making me an offer. I suspected she would if I showed exceptional talent, but now that she did, it puts me in a tough spot. Renjiro thought as his smile faltered slightly as he considered Shizuka's offer. 
I'm honored by your offer, Shizuka-sensei, Renjiro began respectfully, but I am already serving in the military force so becoming a medical nin would be hard at the moment. Not many people knew that Renjiro was only serving in the military force for a year, so he decided to use that as an excuse to politely reject Shizuka's offer. Shizuka's brow furrowed in confusion at Renjiro's response, serving in the military force? Is he just making things up? Ooh, I remember seeing him suing the Sharingan, so he might be part of the Uchiha clan despite not carrying their name. After the realization dawned on her, she said, Ah, I see, I understand, Renjiro. Whatever path you choose, I have no doubt that you'll continue to excel. Just know that the doors of the medical nin division are always open to you should you ever change your mind. Renjiro offered Shizuka a grateful smile, appreciating her understanding and support. Thank you, Shizuka-sensei. I'll keep that in mind. While Shizuka had accepted Renjiro's refusal, that didn't mean that she wouldn't do everything in her power to sweeten the offer. And what would be more enticing than being the disciple of one of the legendary Sanins? As Shizuka made a compelling recommendation regarding Renjiro's potential as a disciple Tsunade listened intently, her expression thoughtful as she processed Shizuka's words. However, Tsunade's expression grew somber as she considered Shizuka's suggestion. Taking Renjiro as a disciple. It's not a decision to be made lightly, Tsunade explained, her tone grave. He is associated with the Uchiha clan despite the original alliance between the Uchiha and the Senju that formed our village, there's still lingering prejudice between the clans. The history between the Senju and the Uchiha was fraught with tension, stemming from centuries of rivalry and animosity. While the village had been founded on the principles of unity and cooperation, old wounds ran deep. Tsunade sighed, as much as I wouldn't have a problem taking him under my wing as long as he is talented enough, I fear that it wouldn't look good for a lot of people from both clans. Shizuka nodded in understanding, I understand, Tsunade-sama. It's a complicated situation, to say the least. As Shizuka left her office, Tsunade was deep in thought. Uzumaki Renjiro? Why does that name sound familiar? I have been putting this off for a long time, but maybe I need to learn the Raisingan or Chidori, Renjiro thought as he sat in the quiet solitude of his home, replaying the intense battle he had experienced with Ohashi in Ishigekure a few days ago. The Sharingan's ability to recall and scrutinize past events in vivid detail proved invaluable to Renjiro. It allowed Renjiro to dissect the fight with clinical precision, identifying strengths and weaknesses in his fighting style. He replayed the sequences of the battle in his mind, examining the strategies and tactics employed by both himself and Ohashi. As he continued with analysis, Renjiro couldn't help but acknowledge a sobering truth. While his victory over Ohashi, a Jounin, was commendable, it wasn't solely due to his skill. A series of fortunate events had tilted the scales in his favor, leading to a victory that was as much about luck as it was about ability. Sigh. Renjiro sighed and leaned back in his chair. Despite the fact that I managed to kill Ohashi, the first Jounin I went up against and won, if he was a tad bit smarter, I wouldn't even be here thinking about the fight and the Kurigane clan would have a shinobi with the Sharingans. The most significant factor was the shockwave he had released upon awakening his second chakra Senu ability, the Adamantin Chains. This powerful shockwave had caused far more damage than any of his physical attacks, tipping the scales in his favor during the critical moments of the fight. If I hadn't awakened the Adamantin Chains at that exact time, everything I had and have been working towards would have ended. It even makes me feel like I am a character in a book with how it happened just at the right time. But who am I kidding, it probably happened due to the stressful situation I was in. Renjiro concluded. Renjiro also recalled how Ohashi's own actions had inadvertently contributed to his downfall. Summoning Mizuki had been a costly mistake for the Jounin, as it had severely depleted his chakra reserves. Fortunately, Renjiro had taken advantage of this by injuring Mizuki to the extent that it did not have any other option other than activating the reverse summoning technique. This caused additional damage to Ohashi, whose body was already ravaged by the shockwave, indirectly weakening him more. While it wasn't my fault for fighting such a greedy and overconfident opponent, I need to make sure that the next time I face anyone during missions I have more chances of winning the fight or even in the worst case scenario, have ways of escaping. 
Rinjiro decided because he knew that relying on the mistakes of others was not a sustainable strategy. The only props I can give to Ohashi are his ingenious use of Juenjutsu seals and his transformation technique. Ohashi's skill with Juenjutsu had been impressive, and his transformation had presented a formidable challenge that Renjiro was not sure he would overcome with brute force if his Genjutsu failed. These techniques forced him to adapt quickly and think on his feet, testing his abilities to their limits. Moreover, Renjiro recognized the need to develop countermeasures against Juenjutsu. Ohashi's ingenious use of these seals demonstrated their potential to turn the tide of a battle. Given their power and the element of surprise they could bring, Renjiro knew that understanding and neutralizing Juenjutsu would be crucial. He intended to study the concepts behind these seals from Ohashi's memories. But in order to do that, I need to learn some Yamanaka clan jutsus as planned. Should I start learning it now? Or wait until after I am done with the force since I only have a couple of months left? While Renjiro had already seen Fujioka performing one of such jutsus, he could not completely memorize the chakra as Fujioka's mastery only afforded him gaps in how the technique worked. I think waiting should be the best thing to do, at least for now. I could be exposed to more situations where the jutsu is required which will make things easier once I start to learn it. I can even ask for tips from Fujioka if I don't get any exposure to the jutsu. All in all, my current jutsu repertoire needs some improvements. While it is impressive in its own way as I have already mastered all wind jutsus and I am closer to mastering the fire one since I have been going around copying any and every shinobi I could, I don't have many destructive jutsus. I guess this is how Kakashi felt since he knew over a thousand jutsus, but he only relied on a few ones he considered useful. Renjiro's go-to-fire jutsus, although powerful, were designed to cover large areas and overwhelm multiple enemies, rather than focusing intense power on a single target. Similarly, his air burst and violent wind jutsus, while effective in creating chaos and disarray among his foes, were also area-off effect attacks that did not provide the precision and lethality required for close quarters combat. I need a jutsu that can deliver a decisive blow at close range. The only jutsus that come to mind and I can learn quickly are the Raisingan and Chidori. The Raisingan could be perfect for a surprise attack, and the Chidori speed could be the edge I need against a swift opponent. In addition to refining his offensive capabilities, Renjiro also considered the advantages of having a summoning contract. A powerful summon could provide invaluable support in battle, offering both offensive and defensive benefits. While it is a good idea, I need to put that off for some time. I will have to ask around and learn how the summoning seals are made and actually learn them, which will be more time-consuming than learning the Chidori or Raisingan. Initially, Renjiro had been hesitant to pursue these jutsus. The Raisingan, currently, was a concept Minato was working on and had not yet been widely shared. In the case of the Chidori, its creator, Kakashi Hitaki, was still a student at the academy. He had not even thought of this technique, as its concept was based on the Raisingan. Renjiro had felt that learning these jutsus before their creators had fully developed them would be akin to plagiarism. The thought of taking credit for someone's work did not sit well with him. However, the pressing need for such powerful techniques in his arsenal had made him reconsider. I can't afford to wait any longer, Renjiro thought, no one on the field will care about who created what jutsu first. I just need to survive and meet my required mission objectives. The decision to learn these techniques now and deal with any consequences, which Renjiro wasn't sure would be positive or negative, later felt like a necessary compromise. With his mind made up, Renjiro found himself in a unique position, he had the opportunity to choose between two of the most iconic jutsus that he as a fan of the franchise adored. This choice left Renjiro feeling somewhat overwhelmed. Both the Raisingan and the Chidori had their own distinct advantages, and selecting the right one for his fighting style was crucial. While the Raisingan offers immense destructive power upon impact and is versatile and can be developed further, the Chidori is fast, piercing, and deadly, especially with the Sharingan to guide its strike. Renjiro thought out loud. Even though it is a good feeling knowing that you are spoiled for choice, the Raisingan would probably be the better option. Boom! A loud sound reverberated around Renjiro's training area in his compound, a shockwave that echoed through the grounds. As the smoke cleared, Renjiro was seen bent over, hands on his knees, panting heavily. Puff! 
Pant. Puff. The surrounding scene was one of utter devastation. The ground was littered with round-shaped holes, trees bore similar spherical wounds, and even the massive rock standing before him was not spared, with numerous indentations on its surface. Renjiro straightened up, his breathing still heavy but filled with determination. Let's go again, Renjiro muttered to himself, extending his palm. A few tense seconds passed, and then a blue ball of swirling chakra began to form. As the chakra swirled faster, gaining intensity and power, Renjiro focused his mind and chakra. With a swift, decisive motion, Renjiro charged towards the huge rock. His movements were quick and precise. He thrust his arm forward, driving the Raisingan into the rock with all his might. Boom! Another loud sound erupted from the collision, a powerful explosion of chakra and debris. The Raisingan's impact sent shockwaves through the rock, causing it to crack and crumble from the sheer force of the jutsu. Rinjiro stepped back, his eyes fixed on the massive gash left on the rock's surface. The Raisingan had done its job, proving its worth as a close combat, destructive jutsu. Naruto made it look so easy, Renjiro said while sighing. Moving towards a nearby clearing, Renjiro allowed himself to collapse onto the soft grass. He lay flat on his back, gazing up at the sky as he caught his breath. At least I have finally mastered the Raisingan, it had been a long and grueling two days of intense training to master the Raisingan. Every muscle in his body ached from the recoil, and his chakra reserves were nearly depleted, but the sense of accomplishment outweighed the fatigue. While Renjiro possessed larger chakra reserves than most, the intensive training to master the Raisingan had drained him significantly. The earlier stages of learning the Jutsu were particularly demanding, requiring precise chakra control and a substantial amount of chakra. Fortunately, as he learned the Jutsu, the chakra expenditure reduced. Lying on the grass, Renjiro reflected on his decision to learn the Raisingan before the Chidori. Unlike the Chidori, which was also primarily a close combat jutsu, the Raisingan can be more than just a short-range attack. It offers more with the variations it had as the series went on that could adapt to different combat scenarios. With the right modifications, it can be used at mid-range as well. So it was like hitting numerous birds with one stone. Renjiro recalled the different forms and applications he had read about and seen, from the standard Raisingan to the giant Raisingan and even the Raisin Shuriken, each providing unique tactical advantages. Its power is also acceptable. Especially with the fact that you can hit your opponent with it at point-blank range. I wonder how much power the Odama Raisingan will hold. His choice was also influenced by the need for a powerful, yet adaptable Jutsu. The Raisingan's lack of hand signs meant it could be executed quickly, a crucial factor in high-speed combat. In battles, having a technique that could be modified for various situations was invaluable. This was especially true if he could succeed in adding wind release to the Raisingan, transforming it into a throwable jutsu. The thought of a mid-range Raisingan, cutting through the air with devastating precision, excited Renjiro. The only basic chakra natures ever used were wind and lightning chakra natures. While the first one made the Raisingan throwable, the last one, although it had made the jutsu unstable in some cases, could lead to the Raisingan vanishing. So that only left fire, water and earth basic chakra natures. Out of the three, the only viable one to experiment with will be power as it adds on the jutsu's destructive power. Still, having the speed and piercing power of the Chidori would be good. Renjiro wasn't dismissing the idea of learning the Chidori, he simply wanted to focus on mastering the Raisingan first. The real question is which Raisingan variation should I first focus on now that I have mastered the basic form of the Jutsu? Renjiro thought as he gazed at the moving cloud while scratching his chin. Each one offered unique advantages that could significantly enhance his combat style. Renjiro needed to choose the ones that would provide the greatest benefit for his current needs and future battles. First, he considered the Odama Raisingan. This variant was renowned for its sheer offensive power. The standard Raisingan already packed a considerable punch, capable of causing significant damage, but the Odama Raisingan took this to an entirely new level. Its increased size and force would enable him to deliver devastating blows, breaking through defenses that might withstand lesser attacks. The ability to cause widespread destruction made the Odama Raisingan an ideal choice for intense confrontations where overwhelming power could turn the tide in his favor. 
While he had his fire jutsus that could do the same, there was no harm in getting alternatives. For instance, if Renjiro came across a shinobi who had an immunity or affinity to fire, then he could jutsu switch to the Odama Raisingan. Next, Renjiro turned his thoughts to the compressed Raisingan. This variant's primary strength lay in its precision and penetrative capability. By compressing the chakra into a denser form, the compressed Raisingan gained the ability to pierce through tough defenses. This feature was particularly useful for situations where brute force alone wasn't enough. The whole Mizuki situation was the best example of this. His tough shell was a nuisance to deal with. While my adamantin chains came through, I might fail to use them when my reserves is low since they are really chakra intrusive. In contrast, the compressed Raisingan offered a more efficient use of his energy, providing a powerful armor-piercing attack without the heavy chakra drain. Lastly, the vanishing Raisingan intrigued Renjiro for its strategic potential. This variant allowed the Raisingan to disappear from sight, providing a unique advantage in stealth and surprise attacks. In combat, an opponent might lower their guard if they believed the attack had failed or vanished, giving Renjiro the perfect opportunity to strike. This should be the second variation that I need to work on after the wind release one. It will be really effective considering the arrogant opponents I have been coming across lately. The Vanishing Raisingan's ability to become invisible opened up numerous tactical possibilities. Renjiro could use it to create openings in his opponent's defenses or to mislead and outmaneuver them. I guess it's decided then. Renjiro mused. Renjiro's training plan was now clear in his mind. He would start by refining his control over the standard Raisingan, ensuring his foundation was solid, before moving on to the more advanced variants. First, he would focus on the wind release variant and solidify his control and precision in throwing it. After that, he would move to the vanishing variant as it also involved adding a chakra nature to it. Then, Renjiro would focus on the Odama Raisingan, gradually increasing the chakra output and size until he could wield its immense power with precision. Finally, he would hone his ability to create the compressed Raisingan, practicing the delicate control needed to condense chakra effectively. I also need to ensure that I only use the Jutsu when I am alone, I don't want to raise issues with Minato as I am not sure at which part of the Jutsu's development he's at. After taking a brief respite to recuperate, Renjiro slowly got to his feet. His mind, sharp and determined, was set on the next phase of his Raisingan training, mastering the wind release Raisingan. On a cold, chilly night, figures could be heard moving through the dense fog brought about by the dropping temperatures. The moonlight barely managed to illuminate their swift movements, casting only fleeting mirages of their forms as they darted through the mist. Their speed was astonishing, making it difficult for any observer to discern their true shapes or numbers. The wind rustled all around them. It whipped through the trees and across the ground, creating a natural symphony that masked all traces of their presence. The rustling leaves and shifting branches absorbed the sounds of their footsteps, making them nearly impossible to track by ear. Even their scents were carried away by the ever-moving air, leaving no trail for any would-be pursuers to follow. The fog, thick and impenetrable, provided an additional layer of concealment, wrapping around them like a cloak. As time trickled on, the figures continued their relentless charge through the thinning fog. The fog gradually began to lift, revealing the rugged terrain they had been navigating. Eventually, they reached a vantage point on one of the larger rocks in the cluster that they had been traveling on. The leader signaled a halt, and the group came to a silent stop. They stood atop the rock, gazing out at the breathtaking view that unfolded before them. The view was picturesque, a stunning contrast to the monotonous foggy landscape they had been traversing. Before them, where the long ranges of mountains met the vast expanse of the desert, lay a scene of unparalleled beauty. The rocky terrain gave way to the orange sands of the desert, which seemed to shimmer under the moonlight. The transition from the rugged, rocky landscape to the smooth, rolling dunes of the desert was a sight to behold. However, amidst the awe-inspiring scenery, Miwa, the shinobi leading the procession, remained focused on the task at hand. We are close. She scanned the horizon, assessing the terrain and plotting their next move. The vantage point provided an excellent view of the surrounding area, allowing them to see potential threats or obstacles in their path. It had been nearly three weeks since they had embarked on this mission, and the majority of that time had been spent gathering information. 
Their objective was to locate the hidden stronghold of the elusive Kurigain clan. With them being a nomadic clan that moved around the borders of the land of earth and the land of wind, it took Kanoha spies a while before they could narrow down the precise location. Miwa's mind raced as she considered their next steps. They would need to approach the stronghold with caution, wary of the traps and defenses that likely awaited them. But Miwa was confident in her team's abilities. They were highly skilled shinobi, trained to handle even the most challenging of situations. Together, they would overcome whatever obstacles stood in their way and bring justice to those who had committed unspeakable crimes. Miwa turned to the group of shinobi assembled behind her, her gaze sweeping over each of them with a steely determination. Listen up, she began, her voice firm and commanding. We're close to the Kurigain clan hideout. But we can't afford to let our guard down now. The enemy is cunning and dangerous, and we need to be prepared for anything. The other shinobi nodded in agreement, their expressions resolute as they absorbed Miwa's words. Miwa continued with a grave tone. As we near the hideout, we need to conceal our chakra. We can't afford to alert the enemy to our presence before we're ready to strike. With a final nod from Miwa, the group set off towards the Kurigain clan hideout, their movements swift and silent. At last, they reached their destination. The settlement itself appeared to be nestled within the hollowed-out peak of the mountain, its structures built into the very peak itself. It was clear that the Kurigain clan had made their stronghold atop this unique geological formation, utilizing the natural barriers provided by the outer region of the mountain range to fortify their position. From this vantage point, Miwa could see the outline of buildings and structures, illuminated faintly by the soft glow of torchlight. As they neared the Kurigain clan hideout, Miwa's keen eyes scanned the surroundings, searching for any signs of traps. In the distance, she spotted a conspicuous formation. Unfortunately for the Kuragana clan, this trap did not prove formidable against the few Injutsu experts in their group. Miwa glanced at her fellow shinobi, her eyes reflecting their shared determination. This is it, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Let's finish this. They wanted Renjiro's Sharingans, right? I brought more to them. Let's see if they have the strength to take them. Of course, this mission was not fueled by Miwa's anger since one of them attempted to get a hold of Renjiro's eye. It was allowed by the Hokage since they had attacked Ishigekure. Nevertheless, this did not stop Miwa from channeling her rage to fuel her during this mission. They had earlier agreed to separate into smaller groups, leaving Miwa, Sonoda, and Fujioka as the vanguard. With a silent nod of understanding, the rest of the group dispersed, each team making their way to their assigned positions, ready to attack the settlement from multiple sides. Miwa's eyes narrowed as she surveyed the towering walls of the settlement, noting that they were not as high as she had initially thought. Sensing an opportunity, she signaled to Sonoda and Fujioka, her fellow vanguard members, before accelerating her pace and focusing chakra into her feet. With a burst of speed, Miwa propelled herself forward, her movement swift and graceful as she raced towards the base of the settlement's walls. As she neared her target, she leapt into the air, her chakra-infused feet propelling her to even greater heights. High in the air above the settlement, Miwa took a moment to assess her surroundings. From her vantage point, she could see the layout of the settlement below, the structures illuminated by the flickering glow of torchlight. There are around 2,000 people in the settlement, considering that they are housing women and children here, their shinobi numbers should at most, be a quarter of their total number. Since she was planning to release a jutsu, Miwa did not feel the need to conceal her chakra anymore. Her presence was immediately picked up by the Kurigain sensors who were keeping watch. Intruders! They shouted. The clan sensors sprang into action. Alarms blared throughout the settlement, jolting the Kurigain clan members from their slumber as they scrambled to assess the situation. Without hesitation, she formed a series of hand signs, her movements fluid and precise as she called upon the power of her majestic destroyer flame jutsu. Torrents of scorching flame erupted from Miwa's outstretched hands, cascading down towards the unsuspecting inhabitants below. The flames roared to life. The power behind the attack was far greater than what Renjiro had achieved. This showed that despite both of them mastering the same jutsu, Miwa's experience was able to make the jutsu more powerful. Despite the ferocity of the flames that Miwa unleashed, her majestic display of destructive power was met with an unexpected obstacle, 
a formidable barrier erected by the Kuragain clan. The barrier, invisible to the naked eye, had withstood the onslaught of the flames, much to the relief of the clan members housed within the settlement. It was good that we finished putting up the barrier as soon as we reached here a month ago. But the fact that the enemy is this aggressive to the point of attacking our barrier means that they are a strong force. Thankfully, the barrier will buy us a little bit of time for us to get in our formations. One of the elders of the Kurigain thought as he witnessed me was actions. They were a mercenary clan, so they did not even bother identifying the enemy attacking them. As relief of their barrier working began washing the Kurigain clan members, Sonoda who was next to Fujioka close to the settlement walls just smirked. There she goes, giving them hope. He thought. Miwa's flames continued to grow, spreading rapidly across the surface of the barrier. The air crackled with the sound of burning embers as the flames enveloped the entire settlement, casting a hellish glow across the landscape. A moment later, an incident occurred that washed away the relived expression on the settlement's residence, replacing it with a horror-stricken one. Crack. A crack echoed all over the settlement, much to the horror of the clan members housed within the settlement. As Miwa continued to unleash torrents of flame upon the barrier, the cracks that had begun to form widened and multiplied until finally, with a resounding crack, the barrier shattered into a thousand pieces. With its protection gone, the flames surged forward with renewed ferocity, engulfing the village in a blazing inferno. I've done my part, now it's up to you guys. Miwa thought as she fell to the ground landing on her feet. With the first wave of attack unleashed, Miwa knew that the battle was far from over. It had only begun. The air was thick with the acrid scent of smoke as the flames consumed everything in their path, reducing buildings to smoldering ruins and casting flickering shadows across the landscape. Panic erupted among the Kurigain clan members as they fled from the advancing flames, their desperate cries drowned out by the roar of the inferno. With a sense of grim satisfaction, Miwa watched from where she had landed. Now, I just need to deal with some of the Jounin present. While Uchiha Miwa was an experienced Jounin, the attack she had just released took the majority of chakra she had, leaving her with little to work with. As long as I choose my battles carefully, I won't need to strain myself. She thought. While some would think that Miwa using such a flashy jutsu at the start was counterproductive, it was actually a crucial part of their strategy against the Kurigain clan. Ohashi was not the only person who used Juinjutsu against Fujioka's squad as two of the Jounins the squad leader faced also used it or at least tried to, since it did not work. This fact alone prompted the Kanoha group to have assumptions and plans against any Juinjutsu or Fuinjutsu the Kurigain would use. That was also why they could not risk infiltrating the settlement blindly since they knew little information about the Kurigain clan's tactics out of combat. So Miwa's flashy attack served as a singular source of distraction, enabling the rest of her team to get into position while their Fuinjutsu expert swept the area of any traps. Her being able to break the barrier through the sheer force of her jutsu was only a cherry on top. It greatly simplified the effort required to get into the settlement. As panic and chaos spread across the settlement, the Kurigain clan couldn't form a strong enough defense. Despite their overwhelming numbers, it was the Kurigain clan who found themselves on the receiving end of a merciless onslaught. In a matter of minutes, the Achiha shinobi moved through the masses with deadly precision, striking down any Kurigain clan members who they met, be it shinobi or civilian. For the Kurigain clan, it was a massacre of staggering proportions. Despite their best efforts to resist, they were simply no match for the disciplined and coordinated assault of the Uchiha shinobi. With each passing moment, their numbers dwindled as more and more of their comrades fell beneath the relentless onslaught. In the face of such overwhelming odds, the Kurigain clan found themselves fighting not only for their lives but for the very survival of their clan. But against the might of the Uchiha shinobi, their efforts proved futile, and they were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer force of their attackers. As the battle raged on, a small group of Kurigain shinobi managed to evade the fate of their fallen comrades by resorting to their transformation. However, their hopes of survival were swiftly dashed as they found themselves ensnared in a powerful genjutsu cast by the Uchiha shinobi. Caught in the genjutsu, the transformed Kurigain shinobi were rendered helpless, their senses deceived and their movements restricted. With their dealt with, they were easy prey for Achiha Shinobi, who moved in for the final strike with deadly precision ending them. 
Yet amidst this, there were still a few exceptions. There were Kurigane clan shinobi who managed to retain their sanity even in their transformation, which showed their mastery of their technique. And Sonoda and Fujioka were the ones locked in combat against this group of shinobi. Considering how their transformation offered them more physical strength as well as more chakra, no other Uchiha shinobi could handle them. One major reason why Fujioka and Sonoda were still holding their ground was that they had years of experience fighting together. Fighting together during a shinobi had a way of bonding people, further solidifying their teamwork. Wap! Wap! With deft precision, Fujoka hurled smoke bombs into the midst of the enemy Jounins. Immediately the clouds of smoke set in, Sonoda followed with kunais with explosive tags. Boom! The tags exploded further amplifying the smoke around them. The two had chosen to focus on sneak attacks, hoping to slowly chip off their enemies. While this isn't the surest method, it is the only one we can work with. Sonoda thought as he followed Fujioka deep into the cloud of smoke before them. After a few exchanges when they first came across the five Jounins, they agreed that confronting them directly would be a damn thing to do. They were outnumbered as well as vastly overpowered. Fortunately, being stronger than your opponents did not guarantee your victory. In the smoke, Fujioka and Sonoda were having a field day. While the transformation overly improved the physical capabilities of the Kurigain clan, their vision acuity was still not a match to the Sharingan making them near blind. This effectively forced the enemy Jounins on the defensive against the duo's attacks which weren't that strong but still stung. We need to clear this smoke, otherwise, their advantages will continue to increase. Yasuda thought, focusing his chakra by making a few hand signs. He was a newly elected clan elder, so he felt it was up to him to avenge his fallen comrades and protect the few that were left. Slash. However, before he could even complete his series of hand signs, he received a sword slash on his forearm followed by another on his collarbone. Arg that hurts. Yasuda managed to say under his clenching teeth. It wasn't like he couldn't just ignore the pain, the sword slash he got nullified his ability to manipulate chakra for a few seconds. This was the result of Sonoda's attack. He had channeled lightning release chakra flow into his sword, causing the blade to crackle with potent lightning chakra. This infusion not only heightened the sword's cutting power but also had the added effect of paralyzing anyone struck by it, rendering them temporarily stunned. Simultaneously, Fujioka had also applied fire release chakra flow to his kunai, enveloping the blade in flames. This enhancement increased the lethality of his kunai which was currently very needed. Whenever any of the Jounins would attempt to use a jutsu that would clear the smoke, Sonoda and Fujioka would attack them, stopping them from clearing the smoke. While their transformation helps them, it isn't infinite, at some point, they would need to revert back to their human form. Sonoda thought as they forced the battle into a state of attrition. In a distant corner of the settlement, another duo, Tobe and Toda, found themselves locked in a fierce battle against a group of Kurigane shinobis. Like Sonoda and Fujioka, Tobe and Toda also showed their teamwork which was more exceptional as they had been fighting side by side for as long as they could remember. We fought some of them before, so I thought it would be easy. Tobe thought as he leaned back and dodged a claw swiping at him. Tobe and Toda had expected their previous encounters with Kurigain Jounin's back in Ishigekure to give them an advantage. However, they quickly discovered that they had underestimated the strength and resilience of their foes. Worst thing is, Toda is already getting tired and Jinjutsu doesn't even work this time. Tobe spared a look to his brother. Fatigue began to weigh heavily upon him, slowing his movements and dulling his reaction speeds, leaving him vulnerable to the relentless onslaught of attacks from the Kurigane Shinobi. With each strike, he struggled to maintain his footing, his breath coming in ragged gasps as he fought to keep their adversaries at bay. At least we already managed to kill two of them. Tobe consoled himself. They had managed to kill two of their enemies, having their numbers and yet their fight did not become easier. And it was bound to get harder as another Kurigane shinobi was watching them from afar waiting to capitalize on any mistake the brothers might make. How long can I hold on? Toda wondered as the enemy Jounin he was fighting, who his allies referred to as Hataru, landed another blow at him. With how fast he was, Toda didn't have any other option but to cross his hands in an attempt to block the block. I can't keep up with him as much as I did before. 
Toda found himself hard-pressed to defend against the barrage. With each blow, he fought desperately to evade their strikes, his movements growing increasingly sluggish as exhaustion threatened to overwhelm him. Just when it seemed that Toda would be overwhelmed by the onslaught, Toda made a move. He threw a kunai that had a string at the end. He followed by throwing another kunai that hit the first kunai. Clang! As the second kunai hit the first, it caused the first to change its trajectory and together with the string at its end, it was able to bind Hataru. While it happened in a matter of seconds, Hataru was able to see through the move. However, he did not want to expend any effort trying to dodge such an attack because he could easily escape by breaking the bindings, which was a big mistake on his part. Toda focused his chakra and a breath later, he released a large amount of electric current. Rensa Rai! Toda said. As he finished his statement, the lightning that he had released quickly traveled through the string heading towards Hataru who was bound in place. Seeing the incoming attack, Hataru's eyes widened as he contracted his muscles, trying to free himself. Unfortunately for him, he could free himself in time as Tobe, or his clone since Hataru was not sure, also released a jutsu. Tobe had appeared above Toda and charged his chakra before using the wind cutter jutsu. By exhaling, Tobe released a cluster of wind blades that hit Hataru at the same time and spot where Toda's previous jutsu, chain lightning, hit him. Crackle. Hushi. As the two jutsus met their target, Tobe's wind blades only amplified the residual lightning around Toda's jutsu, multiplying its effect. Despite Hataru having tougher skin in his transformation form, it did not do much to nullify or even lessen the damage he did. Arf! He screamed in pain, briefly closing his eyes that were different in his new form. Accompanying the hard protrusions all over his body, his eyes had golden irises and dark gray, almost black, Scara completing the menacing look their transformation afforded the Kurigain clan. But Tobe and Toda were no longer focusing on him as Hataru's remaining ally hadn't just stood as they attacked him. Takeda released a few projectiles from the protrusion on his forearms and aimed them at the two brothers. These projectiles are dangerous. Toda said as he narrowingly dodged the projectiles heading his way, a majority of them were heading his way as Takeda closed the distance between him and Tobe. He had been struck by those projectiles a while ago, so he was aware of the threat those mundane-looking projectiles posed. A majority of the chakra that Hataru and Takeda got when they transformed went to further improve their bodies as well as develop an innate chakra toxin that they could release in the form of projectiles. The toxin was able to break down the chakra of the target preventing them access to that chakra. While the toxin wasn't fast-acting, continuous accumulation of such a toxin in someone's chakra network would have irreparable damage. This was also part of the reason that Toda was not in his best physical condition. With the fatigue setting in, the chakra loss he experienced due to being struck by those toxic projectiles made him slower than normal as he couldn't use his chakra to improve his physical capabilities. Why are you even attacking us? Takeda angrily asked Tobe as threw a jab at him. He wasn't aware why they were being attacked so suddenly. He was only woken up to the cries of his relatives who were being mercilessly murdered. Your clan attacked Ishigekure killing civilians and you want to play victim? Tobe retorted as he caught Takeda's punch. And how does that affect the Uchiha clan? Takeda asked as he threw another punch with his other arm. Tobe did not bother answering as he similarly caught the incoming punch much to Takeda's frustration. I can't hold him in place for long. Tobe thought. Before Takeda could initiate a headbutt at Tobe, another Tobe appeared from behind him together with Toda and leapt into the air. Good thing I don't have to do this for long. I just need to match his strength for a little while. Tobe's clone who was still struggling to hold Takeda in place thought. Up in the air, both Tobe and Toda were making hand signs. Tobe, who was the first to complete his set of hand signs, summoned numerous large shurikens which he charged up with lightning. Once Toda finished his hand signs, he also charged the lightning shurikens with his fire. Crackle. The lightning blazing cackled as they fell on Takeda and Tobe's clone. The combination jutsu that Tobe and Toda used was an advanced form of the jutsu phoenix sage flower nail crimson that Renjiro had just learned before the final phase of his chunin exams. The only difference was that the brother had managed to add two chakra natures to the shurikens instead of the normal one which was already strong. That's probably the last jutsu I will perform before I gain more chakra. Toda thought. 
When Tobes' clone was destroyed by the reign of shurikens, Takeda was finally free but the barrage of burning and cackling projectiles was too much for him to escape. At the end of it all, they riddled his body with wounds making Takeda look like a pincushion. The shurikens really managed to pierce his tough skin, I guess it was a good idea to add lightning chakra nature to the shurikens. Tobe noted as the brothers finally landed on the ground. The moment their feet touched the ground, Tobe's senses throbbed at him, informing him that something was wrong. Huh? What's wrong? They were too surrounded by ten more people, all in similar forms like Hataru, Takeda, and the two other shinobi that they had managed to kill earlier. We need to move. Before the thought was fully processed in Tobe's head, the Kurigane shinobi who were encircling them had already launched their attack, not giving the brothers a moment to breathe. Since Tobe was the first to realize that they were surrounded, he reacted quickly and flickered a couple of meters away. However, his brother Toda who was already getting slow, didn't manage to get away. Toda who was too weak to flicker away as he was low on chakra, tried to dodge the jutsus that were heading towards him. Fortunately, he did so without incurring any new injuries. However, the Kurigane shinobi had already expected this and were midway in executing their next move. For transformed shinobi appeared near Toda and using the protrusions on their forearms, they all stabbed him giving the same pincushion fate that Takeda had experienced a few minutes earlier. Toda! No! Tobe yelled at the top of his voice almost rupturing his vocal cords. You asked Takeda why we were playing victims, right? Now let's play! The shinobi Iguchi, the one who was watching the whole fight between the brothers and Takeda and Hataru play out remarked. He was the one who managed to assemble more shinobi to come and support their comrades Hataru and Takeda. It is impossible. Yes, this might be a Jinjutsu. Tobe tried to console himself. He had not even heard Iguchi's remarks as he was still processing what happened to his brother. Then suddenly his being seemed to change as he just stared at his brother's body which was already riddled with stabs. Tobe's mind blanked out as more chakra involuntary rushed to his eyes. After a few moments, Tobe began crying, only what was coming out of his eyes was not normal tears but blood. Is he crying? Someone asked. No fool. His eyes are bleeding, can't you see? Another Kurigane clan responded. A spike in the mood around them followed them with gave Iguchi an ominous feeling. What is this? Iguchi asked himself, not able to even explain what he was feeling. All he knew was that he did not want to feel this again. Suddenly, Tobe raised his head to face the Kurigane shinobi who moments ago had surrounded them. This time something was different with his eyes. Other than the fact that his eyes were bleeding, they seemed to have a glow in them that wasn't there before. Then three tomos present in his eyes began spinning rapidly. Was his eyes always like that? Iguchi couldn't help but ask. However, none of his allies were in a state to answer him as they were all weirdly mesmerized by those same eyes. After what felt like an eternity, the three spinning tomos finally settled down forming a new pattern in Tobe's eyes. With a steely determination, Tobe rose to his feet, his eyes blazing with a pattern as he prepared to unleash his wrath upon his enemies. They had just taken his brother's life, so Tobe thought that it would be a fair exchange if they met the cost with theirs. His eyes had taken a whole different look as they no longer had the standard three tomo pattern that had been there for the last couple of years. Instead, it was replaced by a pattern comprising of a red pupil which was the same as before, three more tomos were present, making the total six, all orbiting his black pupil. His pupil also had a black axis circling around it as well as one that connected the six tomos present in his eyes. Tobe was aware of the changes that had occurred to him both internally and externally. While the external changes were the most obvious of them all, the ones that occurred internally were the most earth-shattering. Tobe did not know how or why, but he was suddenly aware of certain abilities that he could now use. With this fact uncovered, there was only one way where Tobe's thoughts could head. The Mangekyo, Tobe bitterly concluded. This was power that he and his brother had dreamt of attaining ever since they learned of it a few years ago. But the moment they learned of the cost one had to pay to awaken it, it only became a fleeting dream. It also made them realize why the information of how to awaken it was only known by a select few members of the clan. If the information became public, those thirsting for power would go rampant killing people close to them to awaken them. When it came to the abilities granted when one awakened the Mangekyo, it was a well-known fact that the abilities were not arbitrary. 
There was an old adage that said the eyes were a mirror to one's soul, and that was what was true about the Mangekyo abilities. The abilities one got upon awakening their Mangekyo was a mixture of their deepest desires, tattooed on their souls as well as the shinobi arts that they excelled in. This was also the main reason why information on the Mangekyo was restricted as you would imagine what would happen if someone who would do anything to attain power awakened their Mangekyo, their abilities would already be more broken than they averagely were. This was also evident as in the future some of the known holders of the Mangekyo awakened abilities along the path mentioned above. Shursue's Kotoam at Tsukumi was quite possibly the strongest Jinjutsu in existence. Some may argue that Tsukuyumi is stronger, but the ability to implant false memories is far more dangerous. It could enable one to turn a Kage against his forces with a single glance. Had it not been for Ao, we would have seen how dangerous the Koto Amatsukami could have been. Coupled with the fact that he was a Jinjutsu master, his eyes were capable of destroying the world or saving it. Itachi was another example, he was a jack of all trades. He had Nara clan intellect and was one in a million talent who excelled in anything he focused on. His Mangekyo abilities, the Tsukoyami and Amaterasu, complemented his prodigy person with the Jinjutsu one of the strongest in existence and the Ninjutsu similarly one of the strongest in existence. Tobe in turn was the typical elder brother. From a young age, he wanted to be strong enough, not for the glory but for his younger brother and sister since their father had died during one of the shinobi wars. While Toda had given him a run for his money as he was a tad bit weaker than him if he used his summon, Tobe always managed to improve and keep the competition of who was stronger between the two of them alive. It was getting to the point where Tobe was sure he wouldn't be able to keep his lead in a few years but that wasn't meant to be as Toda's life had been snuffed out a couple of minutes ago. I could not protect you brother, but I can definitely avenge you. Tobe resolved as he activated the ability he gained from his right eye Mangekyo Sherigon. There was no outward change, but Tobe knew the ability was already activated. Before Iguchi and his comrades could even react, Tobe appeared in front of one of them and threw a punch. Bam! The punch connected, but the result was not something that Tobe had expected. When his hands came into contact with the Kurigane Shinobi's face, the force he generated was enough to rip the head of the Shinobi away from his body. A simple punch from Tobe had decapitated one of the Kurigane Shinobi in his transformation form, which was harder to do as their bodies were more resilient. Looking at his bloody knuckles, Tobe muttered, it seems that I overdid myself. While the results are amazing, the chakra expenditure is insane. Tobe's right eye ability was called Kami no Fun Nu which loosely translated to the Wrath of the Gods. This ability granted the user an exponential increase in their physical capabilities during combat. When activated, the user's speed, strength, reflexes, and chakra potency are greatly enhanced. With each attack received or delivered, the user's physical abilities continue to grow stronger, mimicking the escalating power of a berserker. This boost requires an initial chakra expenditure almost equivalent to that of an average jounin and the chakra cost doubles every three minutes of continuous use. Which was bad for the current Tobe since his chakra reserves were at an all-time low. Additionally, any enhancements gained during the activation of this ability remain in the user's base form after deactivation, making it a formidable tool for prolonged battles. I only have three minutes left before I need to replenish the ability with chakra. I can't afford to replenish it again since I am already low on chakra. What is happening? Iguchi could not help but ask himself. One moment their opponent looked defeated after they killed his partner and the next moment, they felt this weird feeling before he appeared before one of them, as if teleporting, and punched his head apart from his body. Wasn't he just a normal Uchiha shinobi, or am I just underestimating their power? Before Iguchi could even complete that thought, Tobe had already decapitated another of his comrades, this time he didn't use a punch but instead, he used the chop motion, cleanly severing the connection between the head and the body. I only came here to help Hataru and Takeda because I owed them, but I can't deal with this monster. He was clearly toying with them before because, with this strength, he could have killed both Hataru and Takeda if he wanted. Iguchi chose to turn tails but as he prepared to flicker away, Tobe noticed this and after quickly killing his third victim he also flickered in the same direction. Why are they dumb enough to flicker in the same direction? They are just making things easier for me. 
In a matter of seconds, Tobe killed all the seven remaining seven Kurigane shinobis but one. Why are you running? I thought you wanted to play. Tobe said as he appeared in front of Iguchi, the last survivor of his group. Ha! Iguchi was surprised by Tobe's sudden appearance but he flawlessly changed his direction to flicker away. I only have a minute left, so it should be enough to deal with this bastard. Tobe thought. With Tobe's increased speed, he was able to keep appearing before Iguchi no matter the direction Iguchi chose. This was to be expected as Tobe was already able to keep up with the transformed Kurigane shinobis even before he got his man Gekyo. I can't let him catch me. Iguchi thought as he decided to use the final card up his sleeve. While flickering, he retrieved what appeared to be a smoke bomb and instead of throwing it at Tobe as expected, he threw it up in the air. Wap! The smoke bomb detonated revealing a purple smoke cloud. Once Tobe was sure that the purple smoke did not have any adverse effects, he decided to end things once and for all. Let's see, they stabbed Tota to death. In a quick motion, Tobe made a hand sign and numerous fire stakes appeared, quickly stabbing Iguchi. This was the only jutsu he could use as to avenge his brother without consuming much of his already low chakra. That's is for my brother, Tobe remarked Iguchi, who was still able to retain his consciousness despite nine fire stakes impaling him, managed a wry smile, so he was your brother? Good riddance. But it doesn't even matter anymore. I already made sure that even if I die, I will take you down with me. Iguchi said before breaking out in a maniacal laugh which only amused Tobe. But that quickly changed as he saw some figures approaching. Despite his new ability buffing him up, it came at the expense of his chakra, so Tobe was not able to keep part of his chakra field active. With the effects of his Mangekyo ability receding and enemies approaching, Tobe was in a tight spot. His only saving grace was the ability he gained from his left Mangekyo Sharingan. Tobe took a moment to focus his chakra and immediately after, ten shadow clones appeared next to him. He had counted the number of shinobi closing in on him, and his mind raced as he took into account their power levels from their chakra as well as the nature of the ability he was using. Although this is the first time I am using this ability, ten of these shadow clones should be enough going against twenty Kurigane shinobi, right? While I am surprised that a lot of them showed up from that bastard smoke signal. I should have expected one of them to call for reinforcements. Maybe he had a special standing in the clan. Tobe did not know how close to the truth he was, Kurigane Iguchi was the only offspring of the current clan head of the Kurigane clan, who despite all his strength, had died after fighting Miwa. So when the clan's guard, or what was left of them, saw the purple smoke in the sky, they acted promptly moving in to provide aid to the next clan head. However, when they arrived and saw Iguchi's lifeless body, their anger only rose. Fueled by anger, Tobi became their unfortunate target, not like things would have gone differently if Iguchi was still alive. The first shinobi lunged at Tobe, its claws gleaming in the fading moonlight. The shadow clone intercepted the attack, absorbing the impact and reflecting it back with equal force. The shinobi was thrown back, stunned by Tobe's own power. Tobe moved with blinding speed, closing the distance and delivering a powerful kick that sent the shinobi sprawling. That was the nature of Tobe's right eye Mangekyo. Its ability was called Kage no Kagami, which translated to Shadow Mirror. This ability allowed its user to create shadow clones that could instantly mirror any jutsu or physical attack directed at the user. It's funny that one of my Mangekyo abilities involves the Shadow Clone Jutsu, which was the first ever jutsu I learned after copying Mother. The clones could act as a buffer, absorbing the attack and then reflecting it back at the opponent with equal force. The only major drawback was that the clones had limited chances of absorbing and reflecting damage back to the target. Moreover, the clones were limited in number and each clone drained a considerable amount of chakra. If Tobe had more chakra, he would be able to make almost 20 such shadow clones. But currently, he had to make do with a number that wouldn't strain him. Another Kurigane pounced at Tobe's shadow clone. Tobe sidestepped effortlessly, his clone mirroring his movements and meeting the shinobi head-on. The impact was absorbed and reflected, sending the shinobi tumbling to the ground. The Kurigane shinobi were relentless, their transformations making them formidable opponents, but Tobe's shadow mirror ability provided a perfect counter. Each attack directed at him was absorbed and reflected back to them, the clones acting as both shield and weapon. 
For a moment, everything seemed to be in a stalemate as Tobe's clones lasted longer than the Kurigane clan expected. But deep down, Tobe knew this was not sustainable as more enemies kept on coming. What do I do? Tobe wondered while he was perched up in a tree. Sweat dripped down Tobe's brow, his breath coming in ragged gasps. He could feel his chakra reserves dwindling. He knew he was in a tough spot. Desperation clawed at the edges of his mind, but he forced it down. He needed to think, to act swiftly. He had tried using the clones as a distraction to get away, but after retrieving his brother's body, he realized that there was another condition for his shadow mirror ability to work. He had to be in close proximity to his shadow clones for them to efficiently work, they were not like ordinary shadow clones who could perform tasks despite the distance of their maker. Tobe had also considered simply cancelling the ability and flickering away, but that wouldn't achieve anything as his enemies had already noticed his position and it was only because his shadow clones fighting them that they hadn't closed in on him. Tobe was basically a bird in a cage. Here goes nothing, if it doesn't work, then there's nothing else I can do. Tobe's vision began to blur, the strain on his right eye threatening to render him blind. He had one chance left. The pain was excruciating, but he pushed through it. To his surprise, it worked and new shadow clones appeared replacing the current remaining ones. With their new ferocity, the tide of the battle once again shifted in Tobe's favor. After a couple of hours, the battlefield was littered with the defeated forms of the Kurigane clan Shinobi. The sun had finally begun to rise, leaving the area bathed in the dim light of dawn. Tobe stood amidst the chaos, his breath heavy and labored, his eyes bleeding from the strain of using his Mangekyo Sharingan to its absolute limit. The pain was sharp, radiating through his skull, but he had managed to overcome every beastly opponent. Finally, it is over. Tobe remarked as he collapsed to the ground. He had pushed himself beyond his limits, and it had paid off. He was barely standing, his body trembling from the exertion and the immense chakra depletion. If you counted the number of shinobi that he and his brother dealt with before meeting the jounins who forced them to stay here, the number would be over a couple hundred. I feel so weak. I guess that battle really took a lot out of me. But the fact that I still survived showed the enormous power of the Mangekyo. Just as Tobe thought he might finally succumb to his injuries and fatigue, he sensed a familiar presence approaching rapidly. Are there more coming? Tobe thought as he tried to get up to prepare himself. Achiha Suji, a fellow shinobi from the group that had been attacked by the Kurigane, arrived on the scene. It was understandable why no one came to Tobe's aid as the disparity in numbers between the two forces was too large. As Suji looked around Tobe, his eyes widened in shock as he took in the sight before him. There were bodies scattered across the battlefield. It was surprising to Suji since he was well aware of Tobe's capabilities. Tobe. Suji called out, rushing to his side. Are you alright? Tobe looked up, his vision still blurry. He managed a weary smile. I'm, still breathing, aren't I? Suji's eyes narrowed as he examined Tobe more closely. The right side of Tobe's face was streaked with blood, his eye socket dark and ominous. The strain of using the shadow mirror had clearly taken a severe toll. Your eye, it's bleeding. Tobe nodded slowly. It's nothing serious. You did well, Tobe. You held them off long enough for us to regroup. But you need to rest now. Suji looked around the battlefield, his expression thoughtful. Let's get you back to the rest, the battle is almost over, and we need to regroup and plan our next move. Suji glanced around and asked. Tobe, where's Toda? Wasn't he with you? The question hit Tobe like a punch to the gut. For a moment, the world around him blurred as memories he had desperately tried to block out came flooding back. The image of his brother, Toda, fighting valiantly against the onslaught of the Kurigane clan, only to fall beneath their relentless assault. The pain and grief were almost too much to bear. Suji noticed the change in Tobe's expression, the way his face darkened and his eyes filled with unshed tears. Tobe, what happened? Tobe's voice was barely a whisper, thick with emotion. Toda, he fought bravely. He gave everything he had to protect us, but, they killed him. Suji's eyes widened in shock and sorrow. No. Toda. Suji placed a comforting hand on Tobe's shoulder. We'll honor him properly when we return to the village. He deserves that, and more. Tobe took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. I know. I just. I wish I could have done more. I wish I was strong enough to save him. 
You did everything you could, Suji said softly. Tobe closed his eyes, allowing a single tear to escape. Suji instinctively reached out to help Tobe get to his feet, but Tobe raised his hand to stop him. No, Suji. Don't. Suji's brow furrowed with concern. What do you mean? Tobe shook his head slowly, his eyes heavy with fatigue and something deeper, more final. For the past few minutes, he had felt it, a gnawing sensation deep within him. It was more than just exhaustion. It was a profound emptiness, a hollowing out of his very essence. When he first managed to keep on using his Mangekyo despite his low chakra reserves, he was glad. But he kept on doing so, an unsettling feeling crept up on him. Only once the adrenaline was over and the fatigue of the battle overcame did he realize what was happening. Tobe had given his all in the battle, even to the extent of using his own life force to power his Mangekyo Sharingan. I can feel it, Suji, Tobe said, his voice a strained whisper. I've pushed too far. My life force? I used it in the battle. There's nothing left. Suji's eyes widened in alarm. Tobe, no. We can get you help. We came with some medical needs, Tobe interrupted, his voice gentle but firm. Suji, Tobe said, his gaze steady despite the pain etched into his features. Toda, he gave his life to buy me time. I had to make sure it wasn't in vain. I had to protect our home, our people. And now, my journey ends here. Suji's eyes shimmered with unshed tears as he looked at his friend, his comrade. Tobe, please. There must be another way. Tobe smiled faintly, a bittersweet expression. You've always been a good friend, Suji. Promise me you'll take care of the village. Make sure Toda's sacrifice is honored. With that, Tobe dug into his eyes with trembling fingers, removing both of his eyes. This, he said, holding them blindly, you should have it. Suji's eyes widened. Tobe, you can't be serious, I'm not going to survive this, Suji, Tobe interrupted his voice firm despite his weakening state. But you can. With my Mangekyo, you'll have the strength to protect the village and carry on our legacy. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision by Tobe. The only other person that he would have given his eyes to in a heartbeat was already dead. Since he was not a social butterfly, the candidates left were only four of five. Up on the list was Renjiro, his squad mate who through his brother had gotten closer during the last couple of months. The other person was Azumi his young sister who was already a genin. He contemplated hard on this decision, and when Suji arrived, he made up his mind. While giving his sister his Mangekyo would help her in her shinobi path, it would also similarly hinder her path. The Uchiha always had to live a restless life, always looking over their shoulders. With such a versatile dojitsu, it was normal for there to be cases of people targeting them for their eyes, like what Ohashi was planning on doing to Renjiro. It was basically a double-edged sword. So adding the burden of a Mangekyo on top of that would not guarantee the rich, peaceful and fulfilling life that he wanted Azumi to live. Renjiro was also a good candidate to give the eyes to, but despite them being friends, Tobe always felt something was wrong with the boy. It was not in a bad way, but Tobe could always tell that something was weighing down on him. What he was he did not know, and from the look of things he would never know. Likewise, he did not want to add to his burdens. Also with his talent, I wouldn't be surprised if he also awakened his Mangekyo. With how he is secretive, he might have already done it under our noses. Tobe thought when he was making up his mind. This only left Suji, a friend who he and Toda had grown up with. Tobe took him showing up as the strings of fate backing his decision. Suji hesitated, his heart aching with the weight of the decision. But he saw the resolve in Tobe's eyes, Tor rather felt it since the very eyes were in Tobias's hands. With a deep breath, he nodded. All right, Tobe. I promise I'll use your gift to protect everyone. With a final nod, Tobe's hands which were still keeping him in an upright position gave out, and he sank to the ground, his strength finally leaving him. He felt a deep sense of peace, knowing he had done all he could. His vision blurred as darkness began to close in, the pain in his eyes fading to a dull throb. As he lay on the ground, Tobe's last thoughts were of his brother, their shared dreams, and the bond that had carried them through so many battles. He had fought bravely, as Toda had, and now it was time to rest. I thought it would be longer, but I guess I'll join you, Toda. I just hope Mother and Azumi will be fine. Suji knelt beside him, holding Tobe's hand as his friend's breathing grew shallow. Tobe's eyes closed, a final tear slipping down his cheek. 
His body went still, a quiet calm settling over him. The battle was over, and Tob had given everything to protect those he loved. With a heavy heart, Suji gently lifted Tob's body and stored it in a similar scroll as Tob did to his brother. The feeling was the same since he too lost a friend who had become a brother. While Suji was still grieving and vowing to keep his promise to Tob, he did not know that there were a pair of eyes that were witnessing what was happening. The eyes belonged to a figure that embodied the duality of nature itself. His appearance was striking, with his body divided into two distinct halves, one black, the other white. The black half of the figure remarked, he awoke the Mangekyo at such a U age, he was barely over 15 years old. On the other hand, the white half of it replied, yes, he was truly talented only second to our lord. But it would be a disgrace if such eyes would get into the hands of an unworthy vessel. Together, Black Zetsu and White Zetsu came to an unspoken understanding and made their move. A couple of hours from now, when Sonoda, Fujioka and the rest of the team would search for their missing allies, they would stumble upon Tobe, Toda and Suji's bodies somewhere in the destruction. Only Toda's body would be fortunate enough to still have its eyes there. Despite all this, it would still be considered normal and speculated that some Kurigain clan members might have overpowered them and stolen their eyes. After all that was not strange at all. With that another Mangekyo holder of the Uchiha clan would finish his story in the Sea of Life without his due credit. Back in the village as the first rays of dawn cast their gentle glow upon the village, Renjiro was already awake. His mind was already consumed by thoughts of his ongoing training. He was still working on mastering the wind-style Raisingan. However, as Renjiro delved deeper into his training, he quickly found himself facing unexpected challenges and setbacks. I thought once that I mastered the jutsu that making it throwable would be easy. With the number of times I have tried this, I am even beginning to wonder whether it was indeed throwable or if I was just high when I saw that. Clearing his mind, Renjiro decided to try again. Holding out his palm, a familiar sight began to manifest in the palm of his hand, a Raisingan its core swirling with the telltale blue hues of concentrated chakra. But as he continued to infuse it with his wind chakra nature, a subtle shift began to occur, the vibrant azure of the Raisingan giving way to a shimmering lime green. With each passing moment, the transformation intensified, with the surrounding wind involuntary coalescing around the chakra. With a determined flick of his wrist, Renjiro threw the Raisingan, or at least he tried to. As it soared towards its intended target, a sense of unease gripped Renjiro's heart, a gnawing doubt that lingered on the edges of his consciousness. And then, in an instant, the Raisingan faltered, its trajectory faltering. With a sense of dismay, Renjiro watched helplessly as the once potent sphere of chakra dissipated into nothingness. It dissipated just like before. I remember there were three variations of this variation which was already weird. Maybe I should try focusing on the other variations? Renjiro shrugged, making progress at a snail speed was frustrating, to say the least. After I complete it, I'll just wait for Tobe and Toda to arrive, so that I can ask Toda how he got a summon. From the way he was talking about it, it seemed powerful, I would not mind seeing it. Renjiro muttered as he continued with his training. The wind release, Raisingan, integrated wind chakra nature with the traditional Raisingan, resulting in enhanced cutting power and unique properties such as it being throwable. This advanced technique had three notable variations which were the ring variation, the air current variation, and the shuriken variation. Each variation highlighted different aspects of wind chakra manipulation as well as shape manipulation, to provide distinct advantages and require varying levels of mastery. The first one, ring variation, was a green-colored raisingan, circular like the rest, that introduced wind chakra nature in such a way that it created a ring around the sphere, resembling the planet Saturn. This ring significantly enhanced the slicing power of the Raisingan, making it more effective at slicing through targets. The ring itself acted as a blade, adding an extra layer of damage upon impact. This variation showcased the delicate balance of maintaining the Raisingan's shape while incorporating wind chakra to form the ring, highlighting the user's control and precision in chakra manipulation. The next variation was the air current variation. It was smaller than the normal Raisingan and similarly circular that contained the least amount of wind chakra among the three variations. Despite its smaller size, this variation attracted surrounding air currents. 
The air currents enhanced the Reisengans rotational force, adding to its overall power. This was also the variation that Renjiro had been training with for the last couple of days. The lack of progress in making it throwable was forcing him to look into the other variations. This variation emphasized the principle of enhancing a technique by leveraging external elements, making it a versatile and adaptable form of the wind release, Reisengan. The last one, the shuriken variation formed shuriken-like wind blades around the Reisengan, creating a more defined and powerful cutting edge compared to the ring in the ring variation. This version contained a higher concentration of wind chakra than the previous two, resulting in more potent, defined and precise blades. The shuriken variation formed the foundation for the wind release, Raisin Shuriken, an S-rank jutsu known for its devastating power and complexity. The only difference was that the Raisin Shuriken required more precise chakra control. The wind blade significantly increased the Raisin Gan's destructive potential, capable of causing severe damage on a cellular level. This variation required advanced mastery and control over wind chakra, making it one of the most challenging yet rewarding techniques to master. All versions are inherently different while also the same. I am not sure whether that makes sense. They all demonstrate different aspects of wind chakra nature and its integration with the standard Reisengan. Renjiro thought. The ring variation enhances slicing power through a ring formation, the air current variation utilizes surrounding air to boost rotational force, and the shuriken variation introduces precise and powerful wind blades for enhanced cutting and destruction. Since I am having issues with making the air current variation throwable, I should probably experiment with the ring variation, as it is the only one I remember being throwable. While Renjiro could not remember all of his memories, especially those of his first life, the ones he could still remember, Renjiro could recall them perfectly. It was weird because Renjiro thought that his perfect memory was due to his Sharingan, but it seemed otherwise. The air current variation only required minimal wind chakra nature, that's why it was easier to learn. The other variations are going to require more wind chakra nature as well shape manipulation introduced. Renjiro holds out his palm, concentrating intently as he attempts the ring variation. Immediately, a blue swirling chakra begins to form, spinning rapidly into a compact sphere. With a deep breath, he focuses on introducing wind chakra nature into the mix. The color of the Raisingan starts to shift from blue to a vibrant lime green one, but before it fully changes color, the Raisingan dissipates, its energy dispersing into the air. The quantity of the wind chakra I am using seems to be off, Renjiro noted. After diagnosing the problem, Renjiro decides to repeat the whole process again. He steadies his breathing, feeling the flow of chakra through his body. The blue sphere forms once more, swirling and glowing with intense chakra. This time it fully changed color before it fully formed the ring, it wavered and dissipated like the first attempt. Well, at least this time it lasted longer. So that's progress. I still need to be precise with the wind nature I am using. It needs to be just to form the Raisingan. Any more or less will cause it to dissipate. Renjiro remarked. Unfazed, Renjiro kept on trying again and again, each attempt bringing him closer to success. Minutes passed as he kept on experimenting with different quantities of wind chakra, adjusting the balance between the wind nature and the neutral chakra he was using. Finally, after numerous tries, Renjiro feels a breakthrough. The blue Raisingan in his palm begins to transform, the wind chakra swirling around it more harmoniously. The blue fades to a vibrant green, and a distinct ring forms around the core, resembling the rings of Saturn. The green ring solidifies, spinning faster, maintaining its shape and enhancing the Raisingan's slicing power. Rinjiro watches in awe as the ring variation holds. I now understand why Naruto said adding wind nature to the Raisingan was like looking right and left at the same time. But that was in regard to the Raisin Shuriken. So if this just demands that much concentration, how hard will the Raisin Shuriken be? Renjiro wondered. He kept on repeating the process again to ensure that he could create the Raisin Gan even in his sleep. Once it was at an acceptable mastery he prepared targeting boards he used for target practice back during his academy days. It's been long since I used these boards, Renjiro muttered feeling his target boards. The boards were one of the first things that Miwa had given him after he settled down in Kanoha. 
Brushing his hands on the board, Renjiro felt all the marks left by the weapons he used to throw at them. It was safe to say all the marks were on the bullseye mark and very rarely outside of the mark. After placing the boards in their places, at trees in front of him, Renjiro flickers a couple of meters away from them and creates the ring variation Rasengan. The familiar chakra sphere forms in his palm, swirling with potent chakra. Renjiro does not immediately throw it, instead, channels more of his chakra to enhance the technique's stability. After Renjiro was sure of its stability, he wounded back his arm and released the green ring sphere. The Rasengan flies through the air, however, the projectile veers off course, its trajectory not as precise as Renjiro intended. Crack! The Rasengan arcs wildly and as it collides with the tree where one of the targets had been positioned. Boom! The tree splinters and bursts apart, fragments scattering as they hit the ground. Its destructive power is unmistakable, but I don't know why I thought it would be like the Sunban, Kunai or any other throwable projectile I use. It contains my chakra so I have to control it to ensure that it reaches its intended target. Renjiro berated himself as he walked forward to retrieve the target board and place it away. He already knew what was wrong with the attempt, so he wanted to see whether he could rectify it. But as he did, his senses snapped to attention as the faint signal from the seal at the entrance of his house entered his mind. His gaze immediately fixed intently on the direction of his home. The seal has been triggered, someone is coming. Renjiro immediately stretched his chakra field and after sensing a familiar chakra signature, he flickered to the front of his house. When Renjiro flickered to the entrance of his house, he saw a figure standing there, waiting patiently. The person was Okita, a friend Renjiro had made during his time patrolling the village, which now almost felt a longer time ago than it really was. But what is he doing here? It's been a while since we talked which the missions I have been on with the squad. Okita stood there with a calm demeanor, his lean, athletic build a testament to years of rigorous training and discipline. Standing at 5 feet 10 inches, Okita's physique was both impressive and intimidating, a healthy, toned body that spoke of countless hours spent honing his skills. His spiky black hair reached down to his shoulders, framing a face that was both striking and intense. Piercing green eyes, framed by long, dark eyelashes, seemed to take in everything with a sharp, analytical gaze. He wore the traditional Kanahagakur ninja attire which was a green flak jacket over a fitted black shirt, and black pants that allowed for maximum mobility. His Kanoha headband was tied securely around his forehead, the metal plate gleaming in the faint light. Okita, Renjiro greeted, his voice steady but tinged with curiosity. What brings you here so early? He was clearly trying to gauge the urgency of his friend's visit. Dropping by unannounced was not an indication that everything was fine. Okita's expression turned serious as he responded, Renjiro, you're needed back at the base. It's important. The base? Has the squad returned? Miwa should also be back, I wanted to ask her a few things. But even if they did return, Okita wouldn't be here asking for my presence back in the base. Renjiro thought, taken aback by the sudden news. Needed at the base? Is it an emergency? What's going on? Okita shook his head slightly, his piercing green eyes meeting Renjiro's with a look of calm resolve. I'm not sure about the specifics. All I know is that the higher-ups are requesting your presence. Renjiro's mind raced with possibilities. The abrupt summons could mean any number of things, who exactly needs me at the base? Do you have any idea? Why is he asking instead of just following me? Okita wondered. Okita's brow furrowed slightly, curious about Renjiro's questioning. You know, Renjiro, we are usually expected not to ask too many questions about orders. But since you asked, it's Fujioka-sama who needs you back at the base. Renjiro's initial tension eased somewhat at the mention of Fujioka, but a sliver of concern remained. Ooh, so it's Fujioka-sama? That's a relief, from the way he was talking I thought it was someone else, but why would he Okita to come and get me instead of one of his squad members? Maybe they requested for a break after that mission in Ishigekure. It could be that Fujioka's just being considerate to them. Renjiro nodded, all right, give me a moment to gather my things. I'll be ready to leave shortly. With a quick nod from Okita, Renjiro quickly got whatever he deemed useful. After hastily cleaning up the mess he had created in his backyard, Renjiro locked up his house. 
Let's go, Renjiro said after reappearing next to Okita in his front yard. The two set off at a brisk pace. The village was beginning to stir, early risers going about their morning routines. They navigated the quiet streets, their footsteps barely making a sound. As Renjiro and Okita approached the compound of the base, Renjiro felt something wrong. Why is the mood in the base so tense? Renjiro muttered in an almost inaudible voice. As they navigated the corridors and moved closer to Fujioka's office, Renjiro's sharp eyes caught sight of a scene that only added to the weird feeling he was having. Sonoda was engaged in a conversation with a middle-aged woman who had an air of quiet desperation about her. Beside her stood a young girl, who appeared to be around Renjiro's age, with a look of apprehension and tears in her eyes. While they are wearing the Uchiha clan symbol, they are definitely don't belong to the force. But why do they look familiar? Renjiro's mind raced as he tried to place where he had seen them before. There was something uncannily familiar about the pair, but the memories eluded him, slipping just out of reach. His unease grew as he observed the interaction, noting the tension in the woman's posture and the concerned frown on Sonoda's face. Okita noticed Renjiro's distraction and nudged him gently. We should get inside. Fujioka-sama is waiting. Reluctantly, Renjiro tore his gaze away from the scene and followed Okita. When they reached Fujioka's office, Okita knocked and then opened the door, gesturing for Renjiro to enter. Inside, Fujioka was seated behind his desk, his expression grave. He looked up as Renjiro stepped in, the weight of the situation apparent in his eyes. Renjiro, it is good to see that your eye has been healed. I guess you used your time well and learned some medical fuenjutsu. Fujioka began, his voice steady but tinged with sorrow. Something happened. Renjiro immediately felt it, how he did it, he couldn't explain it. The uneasy feeling he felt only matured to a gut instinct once he started talking to his squad leader. Renjiro simply nodded at Fujioka's statement and stood opposite him. Yes, staying with one was getting uncomfortable. How was the mission against the Kurigane clan? Renjiro said trying to veer the conversation towards the mission Miwa and Fujioka were in. Fujioka took a deep breath, his gaze unwavering. Yes, we managed to complete the mission and just arrived in the village a couple f hours ago. However, I have some difficult news. It's about Toda and Tobe. I knew it. Renjiro bitterly thought as his heart sank, dread settling in the pit of his stomach. THS was probably the reason he had been feeling uneasy lately. What about them? Fujioka's expression softened with sympathy. They were killed in action. It happened during a mission. Their loss is a heavy blow to us all. The words hit Renjiro like a physical blow, knocking the wind out of him. He struggled to process the information, a mix of grief and anger swirling within him. The shock of Fujioka's words reverberated in his mind. In an odd sense, the thought of dying had never really crossed his mind as much as he thought it would when he arrived in this world. The whole Ohashi incident had been a close call, yet Renjiro had innately believed that he would manage to get out of that vulnerable situation in one way or another. Despite being a shinobi in one of the most dangerous and war-torn eras of the shinobi world, Renjiro found that this reality did not keep him on his toes as much as he had expected. Instead, it had fostered a kind of dangerous complacency. He had always considered himself to be invincible, even if he didn't directly think about it, Renjiro felt that it slowly became etched in his subconscious. His skills and progress gave him a confidence that bordered on arrogance. But now, hearing about the deaths of Toda and Tobe, he was jolted out of his delusion. The news was a stark reminder of the fragility of life, even for those as skilled and strong as his fallen comrades. How, how did it happen? Fujioka's gaze hardened slightly, his jaw tightening. We don't know much, but Tobe and another shinobi's bodies were found without their eyes, while Toda's was already stored in a scroll. Were they targeted because of their eyes? Fujioka leaned back in his chair, that we are not sure of, since they were the only ones whose Sharingan were taken, which is odd. Toda's body was already stored in a scroll, right? So he might have died earlier, his brother? Fujioka nodded, his expression somber. Yes, that is most likely what happened. Tobe might have witnessed that and maybe even awakened the man Gekyo. It would have been traumatic for him. But awakening the man Gekyo would give him a huge power boost that would enable him to keep himself alive. Renjiro thought. 
But the fact that another shinobi also lost his eyes like Tobe complicates this. They might have met a sadistic enemy who had a pervaded joy in obtaining their eyes. Fujioka's voice broke through his thoughts, his expression still somber. I understand. They were exceptional shinobi, and their loss is a heavy blow to us all. But this is the reality we live in. As shinobi, we are always walking the line between life and death. With a knowing look in his eyes. Besides, that's not what I called you here for. Rinjiro's brows furrowed, what could be more important than this? He wondered. Clearing his voice, Fujioka said, would you like to be a squad leader? Would you like to be a squad leader? Rinjiro did not even know where to begin. Between this and the news about Tobe and Toda's death, he wasn't sure whether he was actually in the right state of mind. A squad leader? I guess the news about Tobe and Toda's death really hit me badly. I am even starting to hear my own things. Renjiro surmised. Fujioka-sama, I don't think I am in the right state of mind. I am even imagining my own things. I just heard you asking me if I would like to be a squad, but that is impossible because I am still just a second-rank officer. Renjiro said with a nervous chuckle. Renjiro released a chuckle not because there was something to laugh about, although the possibility of him becoming a squad leader in under seven months of serving in the force was one, but because he was trying to cope with the somber mood of the room as well as the tragic news he had just received. Fujioka gave Renjiro an expressionless look as his tone became serious, yet there was a hint of hope in it. Renjiro, that is exactly what I said. I want to offer you the position of squad leader. You've shown exceptional skill and leadership qualities. We need someone like you to step up and guide the team. Wait what? He was actually serious? Renjiro's face was washed blank in confusion. Here he was thinking that he was imagining things when Fujioka actually asked him that question. But why is he asking me this? I have actually never paid any thought to taking any ranks in the force. The plan was to serve here for a year and then choose if I want to continue or depart. But becoming a squad leader is a lot of work. While I am not lazy since I find more efficient ways to complete tasks, am I sure I am ready for that kind of commitment? But why? Rinjiro remarked after taking a moment to ponder on it. Usually, in situations where a squad loses some of its high-ranking officers in wars or missions, the lower-ranked officers are promoted by default. However, our situation is different. Fujioka began before he took a momentary pause when there was an involuntary change in his voice. It subtly started to break, which Renjiro picked up on. It was clear that Fujioka was trying his best to maintain the composure that Renjiro had come to rely on for the past few months. If only one of them had died, then the other would have been promoted to the post, but since they both died now you will be promoted to the first rank and officially become the assistant squad leader. However, we are currently only two people in this squad. So I thought that instead of that, why don't I just recommend you as a squad leader since I want to retire? Fujioka dropped another huge news on Renjiro. He is retiring? Is it because of Toda and Tobe? Renjiro wondered. At this point, he was just numb. The number of important news he had received in the last couple of minutes was too much for him to bear. Seeing his squad member still speechless, Fujioka decided to continue, I am sure you are wondering if it is because of your squad members dying, but no that is the reason. Ever since Kagami left, we have been understaffed, but that was intentional. After Kagami became a squad leader, I just felt like my time in the force and as a shinobi was coming to an end. What is he talking about? He is not that old at all. Renjiro wondered. I had actually given myself until when one of you will become strong and mature enough to become a squad to finally make a decision. But now, I think it is time. So I am sure you will make a good squad leader Renjiro. I have only been in the force for a few months, I don't even know whether I will still be here after a few months. And on top of that, I am still a Chunin. Renjiro countered. Briefly shaking his head, Fujioka said, you being here for a short while does not change things and besides, I was only an elite Jounin when I became a squad leader. But that is not even a fair comparison since you are much more powerful than I was when I was your age. He already set his mind, didn't he? But this still feels like a decision that will come back and hunt me if choose the wrong path. But let's first see whether there are some benefits coming with the position. Are there any benefits of becoming a squad leader? Renjiro inquired. 
I thought he would argue about the power part. It seems I was right thinking that there was more to what he was showing us. Fujioka thought. Nothing much, the clan just provides you with a better house and better pay. You also get access to the clan's information network, as well as picking any missions that are available to the police force. Well, that's only if your squad captain is as lax as Sonoda is. While it is not much of a benefit, Renjiro does not need to know that. Meanwhile, Renjiro was keenly listed to Fujioka. The benefits are not really enticing. My seals earn me more money than I know how to spend. I can also get myself a new home if the need arises. The only somewhat enticing benefit is being able to choose missions which will enable me to go out of the village at my choosing. But I will also be with my squad, so I won't get the privacy I need to enact some of my plans. You will also gain access to the full Uchiha clan repository where we keep all the advanced techniques we copied from other clans both in and out of the village. It will also include access to some of the clan's forbidden techniques. At the mention of forbidden techniques, Renjiro's face lit up, which Fujioka noticed. So I can get a chance to learn the Izanagi and Izanami? With my regeneration, this could even make me immortal so sign me up. Will I have a major say on who joins my squad? Renjiro asked. While he was already sold on the idea, he still had to ask a few things for clarification. Yes and no. As you saw with Kagami, you will get to choose who becomes a member of your squad, but if your superior such as Sonoda wants someone to fill an empty spot on your squad, you will have to agree. Fujioka nodded. Fair enough. I just hope that I won't regret this. Renjiro thought. Okay then Fujioka-sama how does one become a squad leader? Fujioka's face beamed up when Renjiro agreed to take him up on his offer. I will have to first talk to Sonoda and then give you more details about that as the test varies from time to time. Renjiro nodded to that before adding, I will wait for that. But Fujioka-sama are you sure you can't stay as a squad leader for a little while? Caught unaware by the question, Fujioka answered, I have already made up my mind and talked to Sonoda. I fear that if I change my mind, he will kill me for all the paperwork he has to sort out, as he has already started the process. Besides, my family is also continuing to grow. Renjiro nodded as he remembered hearing about having an infant that he was taking care of back at home. His wife had given birth a couple of years back. That reminds me of something, my eldest son is already in the academy and will graduate by the time you become a Jounin. So when he starts serving in the force, please promise me that you will guide and protect him. He is a handful in time, just like me in my younger days. Rinjiro raised a brow at this and asked, I will do so, but can you tell me his name so that I remember him when I met him? Yes, he was named after my father. He is Uchiha Abido. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.